All right. Uh, good morning. My name is James Pepper. I'm the chair of the Cannabis Control Board. Today is June 10th, 2021. It's uh, currently 9.32 and I'm going to call this meeting to order. Um, I'm going to do a few administrative details before we move to the agenda. Um, our finalist for our executive director position has accepted, so we'll be voting on that decision publicly later today. Um, and now that our core team is in place, we're going to be moving to um, recruiting and hiring a consultant. Uh, Kyle has drafted a request for services that details kind of the scope of what we're looking for. Um, we'll be posting that to our website later this week. Um, on Monday, uh, the governor signed S25, um, which among other uh, changes adds members to our advisory committee, pushes our fee structure report, um, which was supposed to be submitted on April 1st to October 1st. Um, it establishes the Cannabis Business Development Fund. It accelerates the transfer of to the Cannabis Control Board of the Medical Registry, and it creates two new positions for the board, an administrative support person and a general counsel. So we will be posting these positions as soon as possible. Um, with respect to our advisory committee, um, those names are starting to trickle in. I'd say probably about half of the names have been um, appointed at this point, um, and all um, post those as soon as um, the full list has been finalized. And then um, just one last point here uh, for anyone, uh, any members of the public that are looking for sort of more real time updates on the cannabis board. Um, Nelly, our program tech has created a button on our website uh, where you can subscribe for updates. Um, so that website is ccb.vermont.gov. That's ccb.vermont.gov, and there's a button on the home page listed as subscribe to updates. So I'm going to then now turn to the agenda. I would just say briefly for folks that are joining, um, if you wouldn't mind just turning off your video unless you're a presenter, um, just uh, so that people of the public know kind of who's on the board. Um, so uh, last week, we heard very clearly from some of the key legislators in the House and the Senate that championed Act 164 and S25 that the primary intent of the legislation was to prioritize the legacy market and small cultivators and try to empower the board to create a welcoming environment for them to join the regulated market. Um, so that's going to be our focus today. Um, we're going to be hearing from a number of witnesses that have a much deeper understanding and expertise in farming and agricultural practices and can help us understand a what they hope this market will look like kind of in phase one, phase two. Um, and then also what are their primary barriers to entry um, and what are the advantages um, and kind of limitations of Act 164 and perhaps maybe what we as a board should be recommending um, to the legislature in our subsequent reports. So um, Kyle was instrumental in getting the agenda together for today. So I'm actually going to turn things over to you, Kyle, um, for you to kind of manage um, the witness list. Yeah, thanks, Pepper. I, I appreciate it. Um, happy Thursday, everybody. Hopefully everybody was able to stay cool over the last week or so at least in montpelier it feels like it's it's cooled down this morning so happy that that's the case if we're on a meeting for the next four or five hours in my hot little study here um so oh, first i, I so, uh, sorry i hate to <laughs> break in i forgot to approve the minutes um uh, from yep. last, uh, let's just get that out of the way quickly if, if you don't okay. mind um so sure. I've reviewed the minutes. They look good to me. Um, I think they're posted. Draft minutes are posted on our website. Um, could I get a motion to approve? So moved. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Sorry, Kyle. Go ahead. No worries at all. Um, 
Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited about the agenda today. I think we've got a lot of uh, folks that have been in and around this space um, playing important roles in the agriculture world um, from a policy perspective, from a owning a store that helps serve those that are interested in growing cannabis and hemp um, to those that have been um, a part of this process really uh, from the get-go and have had a voice both in the state of Vermont and at, at the in some ways at the federal level and in other states um, pushing for cannabis regulation. Um, I also want to mention um, we're going to be hearing from the Intervale and UVM Extension later this afternoon. Um, and those are two organizations along with another, a number of other important service providers in our state um, that really look to help small businesses manage all of the all of the nuance, the business side of things, the technical side of things when it really comes to having a successful business, especially in the in the ag world. So um, Stephanie and Kendall, are you with us? I see you here. Um, hi, we're here. Hi, we're here. Hi, hi Stephanie trying and Kendall. To turn, trying to turn our camera on. I don't know if we're, are we allowed to do that? Yeah, if, if you wouldn't, if you wouldn't mind um, turning your camera on, that would be fantastic. It won't let me. On the screen. Is Nellie able to help? Help me? No. Nellie, can you give them presenter status? Uh, I'm working on that. They should be able to turn their camera on. I'll uh, I'll poke around in the settings and see if I can figure it out. Yeah, let's just give it another. Uh, 15 seconds or so to to figure out just so we can uh you know make the most of, of your time because i'm really interested in hearing from you guys Presenter. okay wow well this is really annoying yeah that's too bad that we can't get the camera working it's okay um Let's, let's, uh, you should you should have that option on my end of things at least. Um, yeah, it said we're a presenter, and my little turn camera on button won't doesn't do anything. It's we, not. It. It's it not clicking. Functional. Mute oh, myself, man. That's so annoying. Yep. <laughs> okay. It's unfortunate, oh, but well. it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Uh, so. Stephanie and Kendall, thank you so much for joining us. You and White River Go Grow Pro um, in White River Junction. And I know you've been servicing that part of the state um, with a lot of these, you know, with a lot of the, the functionality required to really, um, you know, grow plants and whatnot. So um, if you wouldn't mind giving us an introduction uh, to your background briefly, maybe what you guys are doing um, at White River Gr Grow Pro, and then we'd love to kind of hear about your perspectives on this emerging market, um, how small cultivators can play an integral role to this market. And, you know, I, I think one of the things that that has been on my mind and that I've asked from a for from a lot of different uh, folks that I've been speaking to is, you know, I think it's I think James, 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 Julie and I all have um, some some power bestowed through Act 164. I think if we set a fee structure that helps small cultivators, that's something we can do. We can help on the back end with some paperwork stuff, but what else can we do as a board to really help small cultivators find their footing here? Awesome. Well, thank you so much, um, Kyle and everyone for having us today. Um, my name's Stephanie Waterman. And my husband, Kendall Smith is here. Um, I'm sorry you can't see us today due to technical difficulties, but um, like Kyle said, we're the owners of White River Grow Pro. Um, we are a specialty gardening store that specializes in supporting the cannabis industry um, and growers of all sizes. Uh, we've been in business since 2014. Um, our roots come from the underground market um, and this experience uh, really drives much of our worldview. Um, we focus on advocating for the rights of home growers and small cultivators. And we have a vast knowledge of the cannabis community at large because we have been a part of it for many decades. Um, as you can imagine, uh, we have a large number of clients who are interested in participating in the legal market. Um, 
And so we're here today to talk a little bit about what, in our view, we think the board can do to support um, and encourage the transition from the illicit market um, into the legal market. Um, at GrowPro, we do hope we can participate in the legal market in some way. Um, we would like to add the addition of seed and clone sales, for example, um, to our offerings. And we do hope that the board will consider nursery licenses or things for stores like mine who would like to participate um, in that way. Before we dive into what we think is most important for small cultivators, we want to thank you um, for having us here today and thank you for acknowledging the importance of small cultivators. Um, we believe it's a, a thriving part of the Vermont cannabis industry um, and we thank you for acknowledging that. Um, it's also important to acknowledge we have a really thriving industry already in the state and have for decades, um, and we really want to honor our roots um, and transition uh, this, this underground market um, into the legal market with policy that favors craft growers over corporate firms. Um, Kendall's going to speak a little bit about his background. So, you know, I grew up in Vermont. I've, I've been in many places in this country before I moved back to Vermont to settle down. Um, and I may or may not have been cultivating cannabis for 30 years or so. Um, anywhere from home grow, uh, a registered cannabis cult, um, caregiver and uh, commercial underground grower. Um, I was a registered medical cultivator in California in the early days of Prop 215, and I've kind of watched how legalization out there has affected the underground market um, and really failed to bring that market into play. Um, as I see today, um, the path to the legal market for underground growers in Vermont remains yet to be forged from what I see in the in 164 that there are many aspects that, despite the best intentions of the lawmakers, um, really work against craft cultivators and instead really favor corporate cannabis. Um, and while, while again, we you have limited control over some of these, we, as you said, we think you're going to be the ones that the legislature is going to count on to make recommendations that will level the playing field. Um, one of the things that I see that keeps happening in legislation everywhere is that legislators keep legislating use. And I think that, I mean, that's a lost cause. As long as you're legislating use, um, you're gonna miss out on the revenue associated with that. If you have arbitrary caps on THC content and flour and concentrates and the milligrams per serving and how many milligrams in a package, um, people will go elsewhere for those things they're, they're, that if if the fanciest flower that's coming out that everybody wants is 32 percent people aren't going to not have it in vermont because they're not allowed to grow it somebody's going to grow it and somebody's going to get it so same thing with concentrates i mean butane extraction is explicitly illegal in vermont and i don't know anybody who wants to smoke a dab who doesn't smoke a butane extracted dab it's it's so we don't get to legislate use we only get to include or not so I think those are huge barriers. Um, um, and really, I think that that's a, a, a big part of, yeah, of something that I keep seeing. Yeah, it's a, so. it's a potential, it's an area for lost revenue. Any exclusion to the or market- lost inclusion. Is, yeah, it's lost inclusion. It's, it's something that will go towards the underground market instead of towards the legal market. Or out of by state. By excluding it, well, or to our neighboring rec states. Right. Sure. Um, well, while we see a lot of barriers working within the structure of Act 164, we see some key areas that we can focus on that we think are most important. Um, the first being access to a fair and equitable market, two, reasonable zoning laws, and three, the path to market for small cultivators. Um, Reasonable fees and application structures is something that is long toted as, you know, a key to supporting craft growers. So we're not going to linger on that. Um, we want to be sure we avoid um, the exorbitant fees like we've seen in California for things like environmental impact testing, um, you know, things like that that have really high price tags and long wait times because um, those really affect growers. Um, 
assistance to help meet testing requirements via access to affordable testing. Uh, I think it's important um, for us all to acknowledge that testing um, is consistently a bottleneck in legal markets. And I think the board should consider addressing that early on. Um, full panel testing is also very expensive and we've seen that be um, a hardship for small hemp farmers in Vermont. Um, I wanna make it clear that we believe that full panel testing is the right thing. Um, it protects consumers and it protects our environment from destructive growing practices. Um, but we have to work together to bring down the cost of testing and increase turnaround times in our labs. And while we do not support waiving testing entirely for small growers, we do feel that there needs to be accommodation for small batch producers, um, either via state sponsored testing that keeps pricing low, um, or allowing them to consider batches differently than in a larger commercial grow. Um, Maybe a group of cultivators all cultivate the same way and have the same practices and therefore- They're monitored sort of, in a different way. In a different way, tested a little bit. Um, yeah. Um, the other important thing is, you know, continuing however we can to level the playing field so that large multi-state operators are not given priority over small Vermont farmers. Uh, the head start for medical dispensaries to sell recreationally is in direct opposition to the Vermont legislature's desire to support small business in Vermont. Um, the Head Start on rec sales coupled with unlimited canopy size they have as medical facilities puts small growers at a disadvantage. Um, you know, as small cultivators, we're going up against Curaleaf, who was until very recently the largest cannabis company in the world. Um, and these are the people operating in our state already, um, and our legislature has given them um, a leg up. I mean, it's, it's um, tough. You know, we're going up against, as growers, the now second largest cannabis company in the world who has been given unlimited canopy in our state to go up against us. Right. And a head start and complete vertical grow. So, I mean, we're really, as uh, in the business sense of things, I mean, we're coming in at such a disadvantage right. going up against them. You know, a lot of people who defend the Head Start say it's made up for by licensing the small cultivators at the same time. Um, you know, our issue with that argument is that there's really no guarantee that the medical dispensaries will purchase from small cultivators or that they'll pay a reasonable rate. S25 attempted to address this, um, but failed ultimately in creating a, a, a referendum um, to that regard. So we, we think it's also your responsibility as the, the medical program shifts your purview to look at the inequalities already at hand in our state um, and, and further provide regulations so our medical dispensaries can no longer be allowed to skirt regulations with little to no accountability. The next big piece is zoning. Um, so allowing cannabis cultivation in commercially zoned areas only is another huge barrier um, as we see it with 164 for the underground market. Um, this was a detrimental amendment added to the bill um, that will further provide roadblocks. Um, instead, we need to look at additional zones in which cultivation may be permitted if certain safety and security measures are met. Because otherwise, um, who's how many average Vermonters have enough money to purchase a commercial property outright without any loan on it in order to cultivate, which is basically right. what has to happen. And, you know, the, the fact that that's the way only indoor, only in commercial zones keeps that out of the hands of most everybody. I mean, I'm sure all of you, how many of your friends can afford a commercial building to buy outright and then invest in everything it takes? Right. So yeah. that's not the average Vermonter you have the challenge of not being able to, to have a mortgage or you have to find a landlord who's willing to rent to a business that is, you know, operating in a federally illegal space. Um, you know, I, I think it's important to think about where the underground market is operating now. Um, they're in basements and barns and facilities in residential, agricultural, commercial zones all around the state. They've been operating for decades with no one the wiser. Um, and if these grows can meet certain security and code requirements, they should be allowed to transition um, into the legal market. 
Um, let's look at hemp as an example in the state. So the we've registered as hemp farmers the last three years. Um, we've been able to register the uh, grow room in the basement of our home as a commercial space um, and have however many plants we want in our backyard. Um, there's no reason why THC plants shouldn't be similarly regulated, um, again, allowing small grows to be licensed if they can meet the requirements. We do really feel that this is key towards transitioning underground cultivators um, by allowing them to transition existing grow rooms to legal operations. Um, Kendall spoke a little bit already to the barriers of being required to be in a commercial zone because of affordability um, and that it does, it, it requires more money to participate. Um, if we one creative way to get around this is if we look towards increasing the number of plants allowed for home grow um, and providing a way for people to sell overage into the legal market, this could provide a path for conversion to the underground market. You know, a lot of growers that we see, you know, it's the, the market has changed significantly in the last seven years that we've been operating in the state. Um, a lot have left towards more favorable states like Maine. Most of the um, large most of the larger growers have moved to states where it's easy for them to do their thing, where they right. can have a big grow. Yeah. Um, um, and, you know, the smaller, smaller growers that are here, you know, they may be selling, you know, five to 10 pounds a year that helps put food on the table and pay their fuel bill in the winter. They're not uh, making a lot of money from it, but it is a way um, to transition people to the legal market um, if we can figure out a way to that do that. That also really takes away from the liability of having a mortgage on your home and all of those things. If, if we can have our personal grows be bigger and however we can register a larger personal grow kind of thing, whatever. Or you might have Safety to have a license to sell whatever, it. Whatever, but to have it be a personal grow that has a path to sell to uh, a sure growing it. association, a club, a buying club, a something that then can help with testing and distribution. Um, it, it's not that everybody's gonna get in. I mean, I can tell you that most growers are not qualified, uh, don't grow cannabis that would make a, a market. They, they're not growing good enough cannabis that would actually make the market. And so that's, there will. It's a way to weed people. Well, yeah. I mean, it's everybody who thinks they're going to get in won't. And, and you know, anyway, sorry. Yeah. Um, the other important thing to acknowledge is that the national lobbying groups that supported and pushed for commercial zoning and preference of indoor grows did so under the guise of environmental protection. Um, and really, the real motivation here is to increase cost of entry for growers by taking away the ability to grow under the free light of the sun. Allowing for outdoor and sun grown grows with reasonable requirements meant is an integral part of lowering the cost of entry to the cannabis market. Um, I would really like to see cannabis be a potential for farmers around our state to diversify their businesses and further strengthen their family farms. Um, and I think we can do it. Um, it's important to talk about the agricultural designation or the lack thereof um, for cannabis. You know, it's a, it's a little bit strange because obviously cannabis is a plant. We are farming it. It is agricultural um, at its nature. I, I understand why the legislature admitted cannabis from receiving this designation. It was explained to me that, you know, the agricultural designation also comes with um, a significant amount of leniencies um, in terms of zoning in several towns um, and with regards to certain, you know, environmental regulations or tax breaks. Um, and we support uh, more regulation of cannabis because we want to uphold the environmental standards and we want to control where it's grown to an extent, but we do feel strongly that you should be able to farm cannabis in an agricultural or even a residential zoned area if you can meet the requirements. You know, looking at things like security of your grow space, your electrical standards and odor control 
are all very reasonable requirements that any grower can meet. Many but illicit legacy underground growers already do that. They're, they're neighbors to people who don't know that that's what they're doing because they're doing everything well and odor control and you can't right. tell that's what they're doing. Exactly. And sometimes you can, but. <laughs> um, we also want to talk a little bit about the path to market um, and a, a great way to support small growers is to provide options beyond the dispensary model. Uh, we fully support farm direct sales um, and understand the challenges in regulating this. Um, even if growers can sell direct to consumers via co-ops or registered client lists like we see in the main medical program, uh, this would further aid in conversion of underground grows to the legal market. Um, one thing I think is important to consider when we look at regulation of cannabis is to look towards one of Vermont's thriving industries, the craft beer market. Um, this is a highly regulated business. Uh, it allows for direct to consumer sales. Um, and we, we can do this with Vermont craft cannabis as well. Um. You know, I'd like to touch on one thing before we sort of wrap up um, what we've said. And uh, I think it's really important as we move forward with legalization in cannabis that um, cultivation is done responsibly um, and that we cultivate sustainably indoors and outdoors. Um, we just don't think that we should have people polluting, commercial farms polluting. It's, you know, Northern California growers stole water from rivers in the summertime when they're low from salmon and steelhead streams and drip systemed, you know, Fox Farm and general hydroponics uh, salt based fertilizers, which have high nutrient laden runoff that get back into the wastewater system. We don't need that in Vermont. It's already taxed. Um, organic soil grows are beautiful. They bioremediate. They're they're wonderful things. Um, if if we think about it, and when can when home grow became legal, um, the city of Burlington had recently completed a three hundred twenty million dollar upgrade to their wastewater treatment system. It's my opinion, and I don't have any scientific backing for this. But if every grower in Burlington was growing hydroponically and had to dump their wastewater into down the drain, which hydroponic growers do, the city would need an entirely other upgrade into the wastewater system because of the severe excessive nutrient runoff. And I think it's really important as we move forward to, to grow sustainably. Um, yeah. And this, we, we feel that that can be managed um, through policy, through environmental policy, um, and that it doesn't mean that you have to be inside an organic sun-grown cannabis operation growing in the earth of Vermont has far less environmental impact um, than our current medical dispensaries, three of whom are growing hydroponically with salt-based fertilizers um, indoors. So, you know, these are important considerations. You know, how do we keep the industry green? How do we uphold Vermont values um, of environmental stewardship? Um, how do we include uh, the community that is there? Um, and I think it's possible. Um, I think we have a lot of work to do. Um, and I, I am, I'm heartened by the board um, and their inclusion of us in today's conversation um, and really trying to, to figure out how can we do this and do this together. So thank you for your time. Yes, We're happy to answer much. any questions the board may have. Well, thank you so any, much. Ste yeah, sorry, no, thank you. Yeah, are there any questions for Stephanie and Kyle? I'll let you take over. I was just going to thank Stephanie and Kendall. You, you. I was scribbling down notes as you as you spoke. Certainly appreciate it. I know we're on a a pretty tight, packed agenda this morning before the public comment session at at noon. But Julie Pepper, do you have any questions for Stephanie and Kendall? Um, I have just one, and I um, considering um, Stephanie what you said about like either residential. Uh, well, I, mean, I guess I'm thinking mostly of, of, of residential. What 
type of security um, measures do, do you have in mind when you when you share that suggestion? And would that add to the cost? Um, and would that also limit a path to market? Well, you know, some of the things I think about in security in grow operations are simple things like security systems and cameras that, well, yes, there is an upfront cost, you know, you can for under $1,500 have a system installed by a major monitoring company. Um, and you can and, get a home system for less than $200 well, I, that goes to your phone that has a camera. Yeah, and I mean, in that, you know, those are things to think about, you know, but that I can get a system with ADT, for example, you know, we're having one installed at the shop, you know, this, an upgrade and it's, it's not expensive. And we don't expect that there is no, there has to be a cost to entry to any business, right? You know, you can't just open a business for nothing. You have to have some money put away, but the, the difference between having to take a current grow room and retrofit it maybe with a high tech security system versus and upgrade the electrical supply upgrade and your electrical system so that they're meeting certain code requirements that is far less than having to go and potentially purchase a building outright for cash if you cannot find a landlord willing to rent to you um, and so so that sort of shifts it shifts it a little bit in our mind um, and it also you know, gives growers a reason like, hey, you have this wonderful space already set up. Let's transition you to the legal market. And it's a it's a it lowers the barrier, in our opinion. And, you know, a lot of the underground growers, they they're they're growing four and six lights now. These are not Eight huge lights, grow, grows anymore. You know? you know, those guys all move. They all move. Um, and some are coming back. But um you know, it's all small stuff now, you know, and really it's like ma, ma and pa, me, ma and pa, you know, we'd love a way to earn $15,000 a year um, being able to sell an overage from our personal grow. I'd actually love to earn, be able to, you know, I, I give a lot of it away. Um, I'd love to be able to grow more plants and give more stuff away, um, you know, sure. Well, thank you, Stephanie and Kendall. I have, uh, and we, we've got to, we got to move on to, to Graham with Royal Vermont. I do have one question for you. I mean, I, I totally can understand and appreciate your concerns about wastewater treatment. I think not ne necessarily even in the Berling, greater Burlington area, but what kind of stress would certain types of operations put on our more, you know, aged waste and smaller wastewater treatment facilities in different uh, places throughout the state. But the other aspect of waste here is plant waste, biomass waste. And I recognize the underground market is only operating at a, at a certain scale, as you just referenced now, and maybe waste hasn't um, you know, been this huge issue based off of scale in and of itself. But I'm wondering from an underground perspective, what, what is, is, is the underground market found any ways to monetize that biomass waste? Um, or how is it typically disposed of? I don't want this to end up in, in Coventry. Um, or is there, is there composting going on? Just if you wouldn't mind touching on that very briefly. What? Well, I mean, our, our plants are, you know, we put stuff, we, when we go out to dinner and it's not organic, that doesn't go into our compost because we feed our cannabis plants our compost. So, you know, our, you know, so well-grown plants aren't going to be full of, of nasty stuff and they right. compost right back in. I mean, you know, composting, compost is everything. I mean, right. you know. So we, we personally compost, um, you know, I think it's hard to speak to what all growers would do when you have, you know, you're harvesting 100 plants, what are you doing with that? I do think it is important to consider, um, you know, composting, chipping things up and composting um, is a really viable solution. And I think that can be part of the, the waste management in general. Um, and like Kendall said, you know, these are, it's organic material. Um, we, right. let's, let's compost them in our commercial facilities if it's all chopped up. I mean, I think sometimes people worry about, you know, anything potential left over on them and how you're kind of managing that away from people. But, you know, if you have some sort of standard for, you know, you're, you're chipping it up and 
putting it into the compost. I don't know. I mean, it makes totally great you know, how to answer that. When I grow, all the leaves that I pull off, everything go right on top of the soil underneath the plants. They just turn into mulch. So the only thing that I have left over at the end is a very small sticks and stems and they just go into the compost pile and, and they go fairly yeah, quickly yeah. cool you know? i've got a i got a quick question if you don't mind and i'll try and be brief um uh are we, when you were in kind of talking about your testing and some of the bottlenecks that are there um you know I, obviously one of the primary motivations behind this bill at least from the majority of people that voted for it in the legislature was a consumer protection aspect um you mentioned something around kind of cooperative cultivators using common grow practices. Um, could you talk a little bit more about kind of that vision and um, what that could look like? Are you thinking something along the lines of the CAPS program or kind of co-located um, cultivation? You know, for me, it's, it is, you know, you know, when I picture that, I picture that you know, we form a group called the Upper Valley Probiotic Growers Association, and we all commit there to using, you know, only certain inputs into our garden, um, only using certain products so that if, you know, being a part of this group means that we're only using certain sprays and, you know, mostly relying on insects for our IPM program and that we're all using organic top dress living soil and that you know, we're not using any salt-based, mineral-based um, nutrients, that there's no runoff, that we're reusing our soil. I mean, I'm, I'm currently on the eighth time of using the same soil. I just pull a small root ball out and put another one in and grow again. And so I don't have any waste going on except for sticks. Um, um, but you can, that's a potential way to manage via, you know, a set set of growing practices that everyone is adhering to. And then, you know, with with certain regulation or check in on those grows periodically to confirm that, you know, then maybe those those groups of growers can pool their money to batch test, um, you know, sample batch testing. Maybe you're not you're not testing every plant, you're not testing you know, every harvest necessarily for every grower, but are there other ways we can be creative um, around that? Um, uh, you know, growers co-ops, you know, and that's... It's similar to like saying like, okay, well, here's a group of organic certified, they've been certified by NOFA um, and they're organic listed, you know, maybe they... Clean green certified, whatever. Yeah, clean, yeah whatever it is. Um, well, the, yeah. well, well, thank you. That's that's great. I think testing in the bottlenecks. I think the hemp community saw the bottlenecks with laboratory testing uh, be a huge issue the last couple of years, and testing is going to play an important role. However, however we decide to slice and dice it, I think is yet to be determined. But um, we don't want those same bottlenecks to, you know, strangle this industry at the get go. Recognizing that there's only a certain number of labs in state that really offer this type of testing, and those labs also do a lot of, you know, testing for other types of, um, you know, whether it's food, so on and so forth, allergies, um, and they're not completely devoted to this. But Stephanie and Kendall, thank you so much for your time. I look forward to following up with you in the coming weeks, and hopefully we can have you back um, at some point in the future to to check in and, and provide us any more thoughts. Great. Thank Thanks you so, so much. much guys. We appreciate it. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Graham with Rural Vermont. Are you are you with us? If you are, you can turn your there he is. Hey Graham. Packed house this morning for you, it looks like. Yeah, it's good, good timing. Um yeah, thank you so, so much for inviting me and my other coalition members here today and Stephanie and Kendall, thanks for that that great testimony you just provided. Yeah, um, Graham, so so just very uh, quickly. So I think the next one, two, three, four, four folks on the agenda are all from your coalition. I just want to make sure, I think we've got about an hour or so for all four members to kind of give some remarks. Maybe we can we can stretch that a tad bit. I just wanna make sure we're, we're giving everybody on the agenda their their opportunity to, to speak with us. And if you wouldn't mind um, introducing your coalition and then telling us, well, telling us what the mission of the coalition is, but also uh, telling us about Rural Vermont as well, that would be great. 
Absolutely. Thanks, Kyle. And um, you're right. So the next four of us are three of us are organizations who are part of the Vermont Cannabis Equity Coalition. One is a, a, a cultivator, um, small farmer who is uh, a member of the Vermont Growers Association. And, um, you know, we often testify as a team, so we, maybe we can also do some back and forth and I can, you know, I can pass early and respond later if there's stuff that's more appropriate for me to speak to. Um, but yes, my name is Graham Yunang Srufanacht. I'm the policy director at Rural Vermont. Um, I'm also a small farmer. I have a grass fed and finished beef business. I also do some ag research and um, do sort of home to farm scale um, build outs for folks related to gardens or fencing or et cetera. Um, so Rural Vermont is a 35 year old um, agricultural advocacy organization, more or less, that through organizing education and advocacy works for, towards equity and access in Vermont's agriculture and food systems. Um, our coalition is the Vermont Equity Coalition and uh, Rural Vermont is a member. Uh, the Northeast Organic Farming Association is a member. Unfortunately, Maddie Kempner, the policy director, couldn't make it today. She embarked on a cross-country road trip yesterday with her family. Um, we that have Vermont Growers Association. What was that, Kyle? I said, that sounds fun. I, pardon me, <laughs> wishes I was doing that. It sounds great. Um, we have uh, the Vermont Growers Association and Jeffrey Pizzatillo, who will be speaking later. We have Joshua Decatur of Trace Vermont, and we also have the Vermont Racial Justice Alliance and Justice for All, which is Mark Hughes and Mark can't make it today. Um, so quickly, you know, rural Vermont started advocating in this issue in 2018 when the Governor's Cannabis Commission, I believe it was at the time, was traveling around the state. Uh, taking testimony in different regions in our interest has been multifold largely it has been around access and equity for for small producers but also recognizing the historical harms and the current harms ongoing from the criminalization of this plant and how that's disproportionately affected communities of color poor communities and and others um so our coalition is really about the intersection of all these points of equity and access and recognizing the the ties between economic equity, racial equity, and agricultural equity and access. So all of those things are fundamentally important to our coalition, and you will hear us all speaking today, and I'm sure in, in days going forward to these issues. Um, you know, I really want to, as I think Kendall and, and Stephanie pointed out, you know, we are hopeful, um, you know, for the work that you all are setting out to do. We're, we're extremely disappointed in Act 164, and I imagine that you've done your homework a little bit and seen our testimony in the past. Um, we opposed the passage of S-54. Um, we opposed the passage of S-25 this year. We don't feel as though they've made space for small growers and cultivators for the legacy market. We do not feel that they've adequately um, approached social equity or repairing harms done to particular communities over time. Um, there are certainly some positive things in the bills, but we'll focus today on, you know, what we'd like to see and some ideas we have, and hopefully we can speak going forward more. But I think it's important to just mention at the beginning and, and um, sort of mark for all of us that we're at like a century, essentially, of criminalization here, um, based on xenophobia, based on racism, and classism. That's what we're coming out of, and it's sort of frustrating, I think, to us that there's still so much taboo entrenched with this, um, given that history and given the acknowledgement of that's why this has been criminalized. Um, so our hope is to really, and our vision is to create an equitable, fair, um, dis distributed marketplace for this product, which repairs past harm and um, positions those who have been in the legacy market and those who have been disproportionately affected by criminalization over time to succeed in this marketplace. Um, so, and I think, you know, this really puts you all in a, in a really special position. You know, at the State House, our coalition was unfortunately not given the opportunity to bring in anybody to testify outside of our coalition. The over the number of years that all this legislation has been entertained, only one agricultural committee, and that was Senate Agriculture, this session took our coalition for a few hours. So that's to say that this bill you are looking at has not is represents a significant amount of um, lack of agricultural literacy. Um, and we're really hopeful and excited about this process with you all because we know this is there's gonna be a public rulemaking process. All these folks, you know, hundreds of cultivators and small businesses who we represent and are in, in our different memberships will hopefully have the ability to make their voices heard here as they have not in the legislature. So thank you, you know, for ahead of time for that. And I think it's really exciting. We're excited to hear everyone's voices. Um, 
So I'll start with sort of agriculture. Um, as a small farmer and as an organization, you know, working in agriculture for 35 years, um, you know, clearly, as as was mentioned, you know, this is currently not considered an agricultural uh, crop. Uh, the cultivation is not considered agricultural. Um, we clearly disagree with that determination. It was uh, put in relatively last minute in the S54 process, and um, we recognize that that's sort of outside of your purview directly. Although you can make recommendations to the legislature to change existing statute. Um, but just really quickly, we feel that designation designation is an issue of economic access um, as well as racial equity and access. Um, programs like current use, like agricultural easements, um, grant programs for people to get into agriculture, these are all meant to facilitate economic access to land, economic access to the ability to produce medicine, to produce food, to produce crops. And when we consider this industry non-agricultural, all those existing farmers who have put their land into current use or agricultural easements have that land immediately taken off the table of production potential. They are put in the position of making a choice to either pay a penalty to take their land out of current use or break a contract with their agricultural easement if they want to participate in this program, or they are left with the option of trying to find an alternative site, um, potentially on more marginal land, um, to try to participate. Not to start a new business. Etc. I think the, the, the last Stephanie and Kendall spoke really wonderfully to the issues around zoning, um, and I'd say that we are 100% in agreement with that. Um, but to give you some other ideas, you know, the national average farm income is consistently around negative 1,200 to negative 1,400 dollars. You know, the agricultural community really struggles to make a positive return. I think even in the Vermont scale, folks are very familiar with the financial challenges of running any scale of agricultural business in Vermont. Um, we also recognize that um, direct markets are essential for small producers. And currently in the bill, um, producers are all sort of required to uh, give, only given the ability to sell wholesale, um, which I can, I can use my business as an example. Um, I think we could also use Vermont as a state as an example. You know, Vermont competes very well at the craft scale. We have a very challenging time competing at the commodity level across the globe and across the country. Similarly, if a producer who can produce on, you know, 10,000 uh, 10, square feet of indoor space and a producer trying to produce on 1,000 square feet of indoor space or 4,000 square feet of outdoor space and 40,000 square feet of outdoor space are trying to sell at the same price point and trying to save the same wholesale market, the smaller producer is going to be significantly disadvantaged. We need the price point that we can get from direct markets. We rely on our relationships with our community members, with our customers. Um, we do not have the economy of scale uh, to compete with larger businesses. And we really feel like this, the focus of this industry in Vermont should be around small scale production, distributing that wealth as much as possible, bringing in the legacy market, making this accessible for the people who live here to actually diversify their income, support their families, uh, et cetera. Um, you know, one way of thinking about this too is are you going to facilitate people being price takers or price makers? People who can direct market are price makers. They set the prices that they need to run a viable business. Um, as Kendall and Stephanie spoke to, you know, small growers who are required to sell to dispensaries or to other um, uh, retailers are going to are going to be at a disadvantage um, in terms from a price perspective. Um, and I think this is a really unique opportunity, actually. Um, as we've seen with commodity markets such as dairy uh, or others, um, well, let me just say this is we at the Vermont scale, we can't usually affect controls over um, economies that cross state boundaries. This is an industry where we currently can do that, which means that we can create an equitable structure to have this market exist within. Um, and we do recognize that, you know, nationally, the trend is probably going towards legalization. And we feel like if we can set up a state based structure, which puts equity at the forefront, then you're going to be positioning these small businesses very favorably when it comes to the changes nationally. Um, it may be the case that some of our laws cannot stand when it comes uh, nationally with interstate commerce laws, et cetera, in the future. 
Um, but there are programs we can create sort of like the Appalachian standards in wines, which can also protect small businesses, just as Kendall and Stephanie were speaking to. Um, designations based on region of growing, on production practices, um, on scale. Um, and the way we set up this marketplace right now can really position our folks to either be successful or to be totally overwhelmed when the national trends change, the national laws change. Um, some of the things that we uh, consider critical, um, so I'm getting a little distracted here by this little girl breathing heavily on me. Um, but we included in our recommendations a vertically integrated small farm license, which would allow small cultivators to grow, process, and sell directly. Uh, we really think this is a critical uh, step for Vermont to take. Um, this is what small farmers do. They produce themselves, they process and make value, value added products, and they sell it directly. That's how they stay in business. That's how they run a viable business. Um, we, this, this privilege of vertical integration is given to the largest scale businesses currently. And we feel like it would be very reasonable um, and wise to create a similar um, opportunity for the smallest scale of producers. Um, and there's a lot of opportunities, you know, to sell from the farm, to sell delivery via CSA, to sell at farmers markets. We don't feel like these are unreasonable um, asks or ideas. We just feel like this is a really culturally taboo subject, unfortunately, and we already spoke to sort of the legacy of that. Um, so one of the, the primary um, asks we have of you, and what's something that is very much within your control, is the differentiation between indoor, outdoor, and mixed light growing. Um, currently, the law does not do that, and what we are suggesting is a, um, a one to two to four ratio. So for every 1,000 square feet of indoor growing, there's 2,000 square feet of mixed light growing allowed, or 4,000 square feet of outdoor growing. These are standards um, taken from the Humboldt County uh, area of California, where it's an area which is oriented towards small scale outdoor production, which we really feel is, is critical for this state as well. Um, and the reason we have these differences in allowances is because an indoor production setup is a year round production. Um, it's a controlled environment. Outdoor production is a seasonal production. It's a totally uncontrolled environment. Last year we had one of the hardest frosts we've had in 100 years in early to mid September, um, which I'm sure wreaked havoc on a bunch of legacy growers uh, crops. Um, those are things that you can control for an indoor environment. So that's why when we try to create equity in the marketplace, it's so important to differentiate between indoor mixed light and outdoor because you're really dealing with entirely different growing environments, entirely different capacities to for production. Um, and you're also dealing with issue, um, as was spoken to by Kendall and Stephanie, you know, the impacts of, of those types of growing. We're not against indoor growing, but we think that this industry should be oriented towards facilitating outdoor production. It's accessible um, and it has less of an impact. We we could we can get the stats for you on as we, they spoke to water issues, but also electrical drawdown in California and Colorado has been extremely significant. We're in the middle of the um, Global Warming Solutions Act here in Vermont. One of for all Vermont's recommendations to the Ag and Ecosystems Subcommittee will be to facilitate the creation of the cannabis laws towards outdoor growing as much as possible. I think it would be very wise for them to consider um, the future impact of a marketplace which would be more indoor oriented. Um, in terms of uh, barriers to entry, um, you know, this wholesale requirement that we, we spoke to is currently a barrier. Fees and costs, I think that's obvious. Um, uh, testing was spoken to a little bit cost testing, but also the logistics of testing, batch sizes, um, locations, transport. Um, we need accommodations for smaller producers, uh, which was said before. Um, and maybe I didn't say it in the original part, but getting back to the ag designation, you know, our, our contention isn't that all cannabis production should be considered agricultural, but that outdoor production of cannabis should absolutely be considered agricultural. Um, uh, other barriers, security requirements, and we've heard this also in speaking to folks across the country, that security requirements can absolutely be a barrier to access, especially for smaller producers and legacy folks. Um, currently in the law, you'll see that there is one standard written. It's not differentiated for indoor or outdoor production, and we feel that's highly problematic. Um, it requires, I don't have the language right in front of me, but I believe it requires um, a locked facility and in a field-based grow, that language is very challenging to accomplish. We were assured in, uh, in the legislature that that could be accomplished with electric fencing. 
et cetera. But I, I think it sh it'd be important to consider, you know, spelling this out a little bit more in, in the law and in your recommendations, there should be differentiated security standards and not only for indoor and outdoor, but also for different scales as Kendall and Stephanie were suggesting. Um, also this, this notion that it can't be visible to the public is a very, um, potentially very challenging issue for those who are small landholders and want to participate in this industry. Um, one thing to keep in mind from an agricultural perspective is we don't often grow the same crops in the same place year after year after year. Uh, we move our crops for reasons of pest pressure, soil reasons, etc. Um, some of these requirements just need to take some of these basic agricultural literacy things into account. Um, uh, another big barrier is licensing structure, and I think that Jeffrey uh, of Rock Growers Association will really get into that um, following me or following um, uh, following one of the, the folks coming after me. Um, let me see. In terms of licensing, uh, just the overview again, um, differentiating between indoor mixed, the mixed light and outdoor, but also production caps. We feel production caps are there's there's a couple ways of limiting supply. One is through limiting the number of licenses. The other is through production caps. We feel like the CCB and the legislature should not limit the number of licenses, at least for the smallest scale of grow. There should be an unlimited number of licenses. There should be an ongoing enrollment period. Um, our recommendations for the smallest scale, and Jeffrey will get into this, is 1,000 square feet for indoor and 4,000 for outdoor. I feel like it's entirely reasonable for that scale um, to have an ongoing application process and for there to be an unlimited number of licenses. If our goal is to affect supply control, then we can put production caps on such that there's no license that can produce as much as it wants and such that the largest license is actually relatively limited in skies. And this will just again facilitate distributed wealth distribution throughout across the state and throughout this industry as opposed to um, single companies that can produce large amounts. Um, some open questions I just want to um, bring up are, are breeding. You know, we feel like that's not really covered in existing legislation. Uh, selling of starts, um, sale of seed, um, how to differentiate between indoor space needed to start plants for outdoor production versus indoor production itself. Um, and a couple of things I'll just briefly say before I pass it on is um, home grow allowances were briefly spoken to by Stephanie and Kendall, and it's our position that the, the current home grow allowances are not sufficient, and they're actually very hard to reasonably be in compliance with. Um, we've heard from an, uh, a number of members that that's the case. For example, if you need to, if you're starting from seed and you're trying to get to your, to your four immature um, female plants, it's pretty hard to start with four seeds and get to those four plants. Uh, you're going to need to start with more plants than that to actually get to the final allowable number. So we've increased, we've you know made a, a suggestion in our coalition to increase the number to to, to ten mature plants for uh, for home grows. And that may not be the number you choose, but I think it's just worth taking into consideration that the current number is really not doesn't have agricultural literacy built into it, and it's really not appropriate. It's very hard to be in compliance with. Um, you spoke of a phase sort of one and other phases of this marketplace at the beginning. And I think from our perspective, what's really critical is that we start from a place of equity as opposed to a place of market concentration. Um, and phase one, we need direct market access for small cultivators. We need to differentiate between indoor and outdoor. We need production caps. Um, if, if thinking about it in phases is helpful, um, that's fine. I think from our perspective, we just need to start with equity. Um, last couple things, one around youth prevention and security. We've we've gotten the sense that there's some conflation of our advocacy and agricultural use more broadly with increased risk to youth and increased security risks. And we just want to say straightforwardly that um, we have seen no evidence to support any of this narrative. Um, we are up, we are not here endorsing underage use of cannabis. Um, we have proposed that outdoor cultivate uh, the security of outdoor cultivation be at the discretion of the outdoor cultivators. And I think we just need to think about this a little bit reasonably. Um, if someone is going to steal cannabis from an outdoor production site, they are going to be taking, there's only a certain period of time, a certain number of weeks throughout the year where that cannabis is, is uh, intoxicating for lack of a better word. That cannabis has to be, it can't be used directly off the plant. 
It would have to be brought somewhere, dried for a number of days. This is a very fragrant product, and then it would have to be cured. So the likelihood of, of our policies or outdoor growing leading to increased risk amongst youth is we, we see as a significant stretch of the imagination. And if people can present us with evidence, we'd be happy to respond to it. Um, but I just wanted to address that right away. Um, and the last question I think we have is there's currently three entities which hold the five medical licenses. Um, but law prohibits one entity from owning more than one integrated license in the coming market. We would like to know how this is going to be resolved. Um, and I'm not sure that's a question you all can answer. Um, I'll leave it there and pass it along. Thanks, Graham, Pepper, yeah, Julie, we, any questions? I don't think we have an answer to that last question quite yet. Um, I, I did have a question um, for you, Graham. And thank you for being here and thank you for all the advocacy that you've done. Um, if we did follow the recommendation of having an unlimited number of small cultivator licenses that, you know, the application period could be open continuously. And we wanted to rely on small cultivators to meet the market demand. Um, how much of the how much of that demand do you think that, you know, those types of license holders could could cover, could accommodate. If we if we um, had production caps on the larger folks and we started with the small cultivators, um, I mean, you know, we don't want to overestimate the market demand. We don't want to underestimate it. Um, and we want to rely on small cultivators to meet it. So, you know, do you feel like um, current small cultivators can meet 100% of the demand? Or, I mean, I, and if that's a question for Jeffrey or someone else, please feel free to pass it on. Yeah, one I um I'll pass that on to Joshua and Jeffrey and the folks coming after me to respond to. Uh, I know Jeffrey's going to get specifically into all the details of our licensing, and they both have a lot of perspective from in the industry over time that they can bring to the conversation. Graham, I have <clears throat> one question before we move on. I think Josh is is next, and I know we're a little bit over that kind of breaking up the hour as I as I tried to at the beginning, and and here I am asking questions. So you know. Uh, well, and for everybody else, Graham and I have worked together while I was at, at the Agency of Agriculture. I, I do understand and appreciate a lot of your perspectives. I, I, I hope that we can move this program into one that's a little bit more focused as an agricultural product, more so than a commercial product. Um, and I agree, it's, it's a challenge the way farms are typically set up in this state to really have your crop completely hidden from, from public view. It can be a real challenge depending on you know, how close you are and farms are often, barns are often close to roads, so trucks can get, get in and out of them all year round. And, and I totally appreciate that. I think, you know, my understanding of, of one of the reasons why, um, well, if we, if we moved, obviously the agriculture, this is an ag state, it's been an ag state um, for the last century or two, right? Um, I hope we can move this program one that that recognizes that, um, as you kind of alluded to, and agriculture does enjoy a lot of, um, you know, exemptions from certain things, benefits. There's a lot of grant programs, as you mentioned, set up for folks in the ag world. I think that there was some anxiety around what happens if these large MSOs or whoever the case may be, whatever the case may be, um, move in here, that they might adulterate or take advantage beyond what any of us want when it comes to some of those exemptions. And I think maybe the answer to my question you you addressed when it comes to the indoor versus outdoor, you know, di di differentiation between commercial and, and ag use. But I'm, I'm wondering if if you thought at all about, um, you know, if this is an ag product, recognizing what that kind of means, um, how can we work to make sure that folks don't take over advantage of some of the advantages that ag typically it does enjoy you know i think that's a great question um and i think you know even if we designated it as ag as you said there are certain exemptions it doesn't mean there can't be particular regulations put on it um to limit exemptions people are uncomfortable with but um in terms of um msos or other entities coming in and sort of exploiting the existing exemptions i think that from our perspective we're just talking about outdoor production being considered agricultural and we are putting our, our recommendation is that the largest scale of outdoor production could be one acre. So we're talking okay. about 
a relatively small scale of production. The small scale license would be 4,000 square feet. The largest scale would be four, approximately 40,000 square feet. So we leave very little room for sort of exploitation or for environment, for you know, social, economic, or mm -hmm. environmental exploitation, I think, with that scale of production. Um, I think some of the concerns around nuisance um, related to agriculture and the right to farm laws, in my understanding, and Kyle, I mean, you, you, you're a lawyer, so you may have more understanding than myself, or at least have a legal background based on what you told us. Um, I believe that the the, new, the right to farm laws um, protect um, a pre-existing agricultural operation from new complaints. Um, cannabis growing operation, for example, you know, there would probably be some things to work out. I think odor is one, but I, I also feel um, it's a little challenging to think about odor. You know, we have housing projects. We have all kinds of stuff located close to interstates, close to places which are far more damaging and concerning than the smell of a plant, which is going to smell for a few weeks every year. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I think it, I'm, I, that's sort of my response to that one particular nuisance is that I think there's a little bit being overblown around it, um, considering some of the other odors that we deal with agriculturally and just in our society in life. Thanks, Graham. I appreciate it. I know we're running a little bit behind. Josh, I want to make sure that, that you have ample time to give us your, your thoughts. Are, are you with us? Hello, I am. Hi, Josh. Feel free to turn on your camera if you would like to. There he is. Uh, and apologies, I was a little late. Technical difficulties here this morning. But. Uh, I'm glad you were able to join us then. Um, yeah, so uh, thank you all. I'll start by introducing myself. Um, I was able to meet Kyle, but I don't think uh, the rest of us have uh, have met yet. Um, so uh, I come from a background in cannabis cultivation. I've uh, worked in California out west. I've been a medical caregiver here in Vermont. Uh, and I also co-founded Trace, which is a track and trace solution currently facilitating the Vermont hemp uh, program. Uh, and uh, through that experience, was really lucky to see uh, markets roll out across the country uh, and have a front row seat um, to a lot of the, the challenges faced in other places over the past few years. Uh, but I'm also here today primarily in my capacity as a member of the Vermont Cannabis Equity Coalition, um, which uh, you know is focused on an equity first approach to cannabis rulemaking, uh, cannabis legislation, and uh, uh, policy. So uh, also I want to say a huge appreciation of the farmers who joined us today. I think it's always great uh, to hear from the members of our community that are going to be the the local small business participants uh, in this market. Um, so uh, I'd also like to uh, just quickly thank all of you at, at the CCB for having us here today, all of you in your capacities. It's, um, you know, the rulemaking process, I think, is a really important step uh, in the democratic process, you know, we advocated uh, quite fervently and for a long time in the legislature. And uh, it was great, but as Graham referenced, it re there really wasn't the amount of time or detail specifically to ag and equity issues that we would have liked to see or that we feel is right. Uh, and I think the legislature in general had a difficult time dissecting some of the particulars around issues surrounding legalization. And they also had a difficult time dissecting some of the interests of people who were proposing or advocating for certain things and why they were advocating for those things. Uh, and that leads me to what I want to say. I'm going to try to be brief because there's a lot to get to today. And I, you know, in general, from, you know, Jeffrey or Graham or the growers you'll hear today, you know, we, you know, support those policy points that they're hitting very specifically. And those points have been made with lots of thought, lots of discussion from the community um, and lots of evidence-based uh, uh, equity perspectives on what gets the best results for a market. But, uh, you know, there's a real split in the cannabis industry, not just in Vermont, but around the country and a real struggle that's been happening as these markets have been ro rolled out. And there's two dis distinct uh, interests at play, one of them being interests of people who are approaching and businesses and entities that are approaching the cannabis market as a new uh, opportunity to create high-valued businesses, many of them publicly traded currently, um, 
who are interested in market control, market capture, high revenue, growth, shareholder return, uh, and competitive advantage. And that's, you know, as we've seen play out, the folks who have, uh, for better or worse, usually worse 99% of the time, and usually uh, because of some of the stigma that still surrounds the plant uh, and the industry, uh, are often heard by legislator uh, legislators as more trustworthy uh, or more informed or you know, less uh, uh, risky participants in the industry. But the reality is when you look around the country that that's you know, simply not the case. And I think that what the CCB is going to be considering today and for the whole time you're, you're in this job uh, is, you know, what do we want the cannabis market to look like and who do we want to be the people who are benefited most by the rules and regulations that are put in place? And I think that there are elements that you, you're going to hear talked about today here from small farmers and members of our coalition things like land stewardship, things like craft production, things like agro-tourism, things like rural economic development, uh, things like equity itself that are just not simply in the minds of or primary driving uh, motivations of some of the multi-state operators, all the multi-state operators, and most of the larger businesses that are approaching the emerging cannabis market more from the perspective of a, a capitalist opportunity rather from the perspective of uh, you know, building a small sustainable farm that can support one's family and be an integral member of the community around them. So that whole perspective and all those possibilities of what the cannabis market in Vermont could be to people who are here, farmers who are struggling, people who've been adversely affected by the war on drugs because of the color of their skin. Um, that is something, and all those participants and all that richness that could come into the state of Vermont and our local economy, thanks to cannabis, is not an element of rules and regulations in an industry that prioritizes the, the bottom lines and the profits of a, of a select few that happen to have access to the type of money it takes to build a 50,000 square foot indoor grow, or it takes to pay for an integrated license, or, you know, you name it, or make donations to politicians. So, you know, all these things are at play here. And I think when we uh, talk about and consider rules that are going to govern cannabis in Vermont, it's just important to really consider and think deeply about who they stand to benefit and if they're being done to protect profit interests of a few businesses or if they're being done to advocate for what's fair, safe, diverse, equitable uh, for local members of our community who deserve a shot at participating in this market. Uh, and that's really what folks are asking for. They're just asking for an even playing field where they have a reasonable chance at running a, a business. Um, and I think, you know, when, can, uh, when alcohol was legalized after prohibition, you know, the three-tier system came out of um, antitrust, anti-monopoly anti interests that were at play at the time where they, you know, split up each level of the supply chain and made it so that entities, businesses, or individuals could only participate at one level and not all three, right? So this is not new in a lot of ways, but uh, it's ongoing and, um, you know, things need to be done again with this rollout of this market to make it so that there isn't that consolidation or domination by uh, those with the most uh, ability to invest. Um, so, uh, you know, the policy you'll hear today, I just want to underscore again, has come from communities of people. It's come through from discussion. It's come from crowdsourcing. It's come from looking at evidence uh, across state markets of what's worked and what hasn't. And although Vermont at this point in time, I would not say is a a leader or a trailblazer when it comes to legalizing cannabis in the first place, we can still be a leader and a trailblazer in terms of uh, how it's legalized and how the market is set up and rolled out. And, you know, the rationale given when we were advocating for legalization in 2016, 2017, 2018, I know it was going on a lot, long time before that, but 
I was still in college. Um, <laughs> I think the, uh, you know, was that we're going to wait and we're going to take our time and we're going to see how it goes in other places so that we can do it right. So a few years went by, people took their time, they considered, they saw how it went in other places. And now we're going to find out whether that was to really do it right or whether that was, uh, you know, just because it was difficult to deal with. So um, anyway, I think I'll, I'll wrap it up there because I want to make sure uh, we can get to the rest of our coalition. Happy to answer any questions. Um, and yeah, just want to underscore something Graham said as well about equity being a leading consideration across all rules and regulations that are made in cannabis, not something that just gets its own conversation on the side or, or in a vertical, but as a horizontally applied analysis of everything going on. So when we're talking about security, what's the equitable approach to security? When we're talking about water management and land, what's the equitable approach to that? When we're talking about licensing, what's the equitable approach to licensing? You know, it's a it's a shift in perspective, but an important one if you want an equitable result uh, at the end of the day. So, thanks, Josh. I definitely agree that it's not going to be a one size fits all type of situation. We've got to pay special attention and and take the extra step to dig into that nuance and recognize certain things need to look different for certain license types. Um, Pepper, we're running a little bit behind, so maybe we can save questions and perhaps follow up with you, Josh, if we if we have them. Um, I know we've got Chris White. I think you're you're scheduled to speak next with us, and then Jeffrey after that. I know we have Dave Silverman coming right around the top of the hour, and I mean, hopefully, Dave is a little bit flexible and we can start his perspectives around 11:05, but um, or so. But Chris. Um, Thank you, Josh. Appreciate it. Um, Thanks, Chris. If, if you're if you're with us, feel free to turn on your camera. Hey, guys, uh, I'm Chris White. Chris, I, nice to meet I you. start. Nice to meet you. Um, uh, first of all, congrats to you guys. You guys are filling a very um, historic and important role and uh, you're appointed officials. You know, you don't have constituents so consider that a luxury as you do your, your your deliberations and i have complete faith in you guys um like you're here doing the thing you're supposed to do already listening to all of us talk so good job by you i'm 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 super positive about this um and i i hope to to meet you all some someday in person um i just want to second everything everyone said i'm not going to talk about policy or uh, i think a lot has been said that i agree with um, as a farmer and a, and a small business owner and somebody with like some creative capital, I would really appreciate the opportunity to sell my own products and educate people in my own way with my own words and my own spirit and, and my passions. And um, people are gravitating towards my farm because of the message that I'm able to tell and, and the feedback I'm getting is like, oh, this is a little different. This really, this feels like Vermont. Um, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm over the moon about the opportunity that is here, and I just really hope that we can focus on uh, agriculture, cannabis being an agricultural commodity, because um, the ancillary benefits of agriculture extend far beyond what's what's valued on paper. And I think right now, uh, you know, we do live in in kind of an oligarchical society, and a lot of people. <laughs> are looking for that value that's not on paper and and in a lot of ways farms and creative diversified farms are providing that and people are curious so uh vermont does a big thing uh protecting its its farmers and i think we need to continue doing that in in uh in in uh cannabis um i think whoever came up with the term cannabis control board did you guys a little bit of a disservice? I think you're really the cannabis access board. Um, and I would encourage you in all of your deliberations to consider that word almost like a meditation. Like, like, are we gonna, are we gonna allow this at farmers markets? Like access, you know, like just think about it. Because if you if you approach it from the control perspective, you're approaching it from that historical or that historically um negative perspective where we have this incredible opportunity to be positive and know that everyone involved uh, is a positive uh, community, uh, somebody who's looking for positive community action. Um, and the people who aren't are, are, are probably out of state large actors. Um, and just one factoid that I wanted to bring to the table just to sort of illuminate the, the agriculture 
uh, nomenclature versus commercial nomenclature. And when you emphasize one, you devalue all the ancillary opportunities that are associated with the other uh, being agriculture that are not associated with commercial. Like as Josh was saying, there's sort of two sides to this. There's the profit seeking and then there's the ancillary value creating. And Vermont, you know, people come to Vermont to get away from, you know, the first one to find the second one. And um, and so one acre of cannabis uh, can sequester 4.2 tons of carbon uh, per ounce uh, of indoor uh, cannabis creates the same amount of carbon as a full tank of gas. So Cure Leaf has a hundred thousand a hundred thousand square foot facility. That's a hundred thousand uh, full tanks of gas. Um, if you do the math, you know I think the assessment of the CEO of Cure Leaf that Vermont's not going to be able to do this without them, from an environmental standpoint. It might be the other way around. I don't think that they're going to be able to sustain their business in a healthy way for people the way we're trying to do it without these uh, unlimited amounts of one acre growth, which actually sequester carbon. So if it's about economic opportunity, create access. If it's about uh, env environmentalism, uh, give us the the uh, the breaks that farmers are getting because we need them because farming is very expensive. So uh, that's that's my piece, and uh, I just want to say thanks for having me. Thank you so much, Chris. Really appreciate it. In the interest of time, again, Chris, maybe we can follow up with you if we have any questions. I do agree, words matter. Put people put a lot of credence in words, and words shape the way we think about things. So um, I appreciate that. Um, let's move on to Jeffrey just because it's 1053 and I know we're running a little behind schedule. Jeffrey, are you are you with us? There he is. Good to see you again. Hi there. Hey, Kyle. Uh, can you guys hear me OK? Yeah. Excellent. Sounds good. Um, thank you, Chris. Uh, thanks for taking the time out of your busy life uh, as a small farmer uh, to share with the board. Um, thank you, Josh, Graham, Stephanie, and Kendall. Um, as the Trade Association for Cannabis Professionals in Vermont, uh, as a member of the broader coalition that Graham alluded to, um, we hope to continue this level of engagement uh, with the board, local cannabis professionals, not just today, uh, but throughout this entire process. Um, so thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair Pepper, uh, Kyle, uh, and Julie, members. Um, thank you guys for allowing cultivators uh, the space to speak today. Uh, I've been heartened by many of your statements and the inclusive process you have begun with this new agency. Um, after not finding much success, uh, as Graham had alluded to and Josh spoke to this as well, uh, arriving at equity in the state house with legislators over the past couple of years, we are hopeful. Uh, I want to stress that we are hopeful that this new agency will foster a more inclusive process and steer Vermont towards an accessible and uniquely Vermont marketplace. Uh, and I think that's important, and I would stress it as a theme, a uniquely Vermont marketplace. Um, I want to stress also uh, that this is not just an opportunity for Vermont and for Vermonters. Uh, this is an opportunity for uh, you individuals, uh, for you as a board. Um, this is an opportunity for all of us. Uh, you can help bring us to market. You can help us arrive at a, successfully, uh, a successful, equitable, a craft-centric and a world recognized marketplace. That's ultimately what we're seeking here. That is our outcome. Uh, so this is also your opportunity as well. Uh, for the record, uh, just uh, some introductions. We're sort of the new kids in the block here. Um, my name is Jeffrey Pizzatello. I'm the co-founder and executive director of Vermont Growers Association. Uh, I'm a professional cannabis grower myself. Uh, I've also been a registered caregiver in our Vermont Marijuana Registry uh, since the program has been operational. Uh, that's 2004 when Douglas enacted S76 for those who were around back then. Uh, I also helped bring SSDB to UVM, uh, which is a personal uh, moment of pride for myself. Uh, SSDP is Students for Sensible Drug Policy. It's part of the Drug Policy Alliance. Um, that's important to me. We had Bernie as a guest way back then. So again, that's a little personal win for me, uh, a good moment in my life. Um, I've been advocating and growing for over two decades. Uh, personally, uh, I'm a KNF cultivator. That's Korean natural farming, and I practice polyculture. That's not monocropping, like many farmers in this state. Um, and by the way, that is not only one of the most environmentally friendly ways of cultivating cannabis, indoor and outdoor, uh, but as Kendall mentioned um, so eloquently, 
it would be nearly impossible under the regulations uh, under Act 164 currently as it stands. Um, so uh, a little bit about BGA really quickly. Um, BGA is the Trade Association for Vermont's Cannabis Professionals. Our uh, dues paying members reflect every corner of the industry uh, from producers to retailers, the entire supply chain. Uh, it is their voices that we feel should be leading uh, the conversations around defining and forming the adult use marketplace. Uh, think of us as the Vermont Brewers Association back during the 1990s when Greg Noonan organized the local beer industry to create effectively the beer industry, uh, the marketplace we have today. Um, BJ formed in March 2019, and since then, over the short few years, together with advocates across the state and with our coalition, we've managed to materialize some actual equity for Vermonters. So, for instance, last year we doubled the craft cultivation uh, canopy size from 500 to 1,000, crucial for our cultivators. Um, that was S54 last year. Fast forward to this year, we developed retail opt in language that re begins to remove the head start or what we call in the industry, the first mover advantage that corporations currently receive under 164. Um, we're happy to report that Burlington and several other municipalities across the state, including Essex Junction, which is looking into it now in Colchester, are passing this language. Um, that's important. Uh, and in that process, uh, our organization has brought awareness um, to the Vermont cannabis community uh, and in aligning and, and identifying our shared interests as a collective. Um, Vermont's voices are vital to the development of Vermont's adult use marketplace. That's why we've created an annual policy survey to ask local consumers and business owners what they want for regulation, what works for them, what types of licenses they want, how much should license fees be. Uh, we have consumer behavioral data sets about where Vermonters would rather purchase cannabis, cannabis related products, what obstacles small businesses see before them to reach market, how they envision the marketplace. Uh, I will send all of you guys uh, the data sets from our 2019 and 2020 policy survey. We're on our third year for 2021. We, we run at the end of the year for the next subsequent session. Um, but just to give you guys a preview of some of the, the data points that we are looking at and that have informed some of our policy that you've heard already. 85% um, of consumers would rather purchase cannabis and cannabis related products from a locally owned business than a corporate outlet. 85%. And by the way, this sampling is just under five, 500 individuals across the state. 65% of respondents say independent testing is important to purchasing a product. 78% of local producers would rather sell their products directly to consumers than wholesale them. 78% of local consumers would rather sell their products directly to consumers than wholesale them. 1,200 square feet is the average flowering canopy size for our legacy gardens right now. 1,200 square feet. That's what informed our case study to push 500 to 1,000 square feet last year. Um, and lastly, just a little sampling here. Um, laws and regulations, which include licenses themselves, uh, small businesses tell us across the state, are seen as the biggest obstacle for entering the market. So 89% of small business respondents say regulation, not financing, not time, not experience, not skill, but regulations and licensing is the largest, is the most important, the biggest obstacle for them when it comes to uh, reaching market. Policy that you've heard already, 5% of consumers would rather. I was getting some feedback there. If anyone else thinks that. Anyway, uh, I'll continue. Uh, so uh, Chair Pepper has said several times now uh, to the effect that no state has gotten it right yet. Um, so we urge you, uh, to stay open, to stay receptive to new and unique uh, ideas and concepts that other states have not explored yet. Uh, I just want to underscore that um, when we're talking about arriving at a uniquely Vermont marketplace, that is critical. Um, no state has gotten it right yet. Uh, 164 currently includes, as Graham uh, and my and Josh, my colleagues, have mentioned. Uh, 164 currently includes racial, economic, medical, and agricultural inequities that S25, which was recently enacted, does not address. Uh, and in some cases, uh, it even compounds some of those inequalities. I want to take a moment to stress that racial equity cannot be compartmentalized into a single priority or social equity, especially when it comes to the issue of prohibition, uh, and that equality must be first recognized as systemic and therefore foundational to every policy and every issue before the board. 
Um, today, we are here to discuss small growers and transitioning Vermonters out of the legacy or traditional marketplace. Um, and as it stands today, uh, it is a challenge for most local cannabis professionals, uh, as um, has been echoed uh, earlier today, to see themselves in this new law. Uh, I will be clear and I will be uh, brief. Um, specific to small growers and businesses, we need equitable licensing, production caps, uh, the THC caps removed, the prohibitive product uh, language reformed, reasonable testing, reasonable advertising, reasonable security, and of course, agricultural regulations that are farmer friendly, uh, zoning and other parameters that have been mentioned today. Uh, for licensing, we propose a uniquely Vermont licensing structure, as my Graham, uh, as uh, Graham had uh, alluded to, uh, our craft licensing tier uh, is a rolling licensing system with reasonable fees and costs that came from our policy survey. So we took uh, the data sets that Vermonters shared with us in terms of what they're able to afford and what they envision for this marketplace. And we uh, explored uh, what other states do. We connected with other uh, advocacies and organizations in say California, Oregon, Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, Maine for years now. And we arrived at what we think is the uniquely Vermont uh, system. Um, this is similar to, uh, you know, uh, alcohol and raw milk. It is a rolling licensing system. And I would urge you guys to explore this model. Um, what we see in other states, when states pick winners and losers, the licensing structure, uh, small businesses always lose out. So we uh, want fair competition. Let the market decide the winners here. Um, and I just want to say, no matter the fee structure that you guys do arrive at, uh, it should be much less than whatever is proposed for the integrated licenses. So just keep that in mind. Um, Vermonters see this, uh, and that's important to us. There are rumors going around that the retail license is going to cost upwards of $100,000. That is unacceptable. Um, we urge you to look at Oklahoma and Delaware. Uh, their legislation does not include first mover advantage at, at the licensing level. Um, Corporate-led marketplaces have demonstrated they create inequalities and fall short of viability. Act 164 is currently a corporate-led market model. Um, we changed this by including Vermonters more in statute with a licensing structure. When Massachusetts found themselves with a corporate-led marketplace and its commission, the CCC, they were dragging its feet, uh, issuing licenses. What did activists do to correct this matter? They developed a new licensing type. Uh, a delivery license. They proposed it in statute, uh, and it is now seen as a national success. Um, so licenses need to be equitable. Um, and to answer your question, uh, Chair Pepper from earlier, yes, uh, unlimited licenses with a fixed production cap will absolutely be able to provide for the market, uh, Vermont consumers and consumers from out of state. We're actively providing for those individuals already. So we just need to make sure that we successfully transition those businesses to be able to pay taxes and sell above board. Uh, Oregon and other states have rolled out pretty relaxed uh, licensing themselves, uh, just turning to some other states for a moment, and they found themselves with market saturation. Um, but those states did not have production caps. So just, that's just some contrast for you guys learning from that lesson. Act 164 currently will allow for large, inappropriate factory farm style production. It will. There is no production cap for uh, rec licenses, as you guys know, for the in integrated license holders. Um, that is woefully inappropriate for Vermont. Uh, as Kendall and Stephanie had raised, uh, these businesses grow at scale with environmentally uh, unsafe uh, techniques. Um, so we propose uh, licensing caps uh, for indoor and outdoor production. I believe Graham had uh, touched upon these, so I will skip over them. But if we, uh, for instance, guys, I will just say this. If we uh, do implement production caps, that will diminish any sort of um, corporate interest. Uh, they will not be interested in investing in a state where they're capped at, say, 10,000 square feet indoor and 40,000 square feet outside. It is your job to make sure that the licensing goes to the appropriate actors and to avoid shell companies in the games that we see in other states. We are hopeful that you guys have the tools uh, and the means to do so. Uh, we just ask that we now complete the other end of this equation. Um, just to move on, uh, our neighboring states don't have THC caps. Uh, for years, local businesses have been safely producing craft edibles and products in Vermont using uh, dosing standards that are uh, widely uh, applied in other states. Those dosing standards are prohibited under 164. For years, consumers in Vermont have been purchasing these products, these safe, limited dosing products, these 
crap products that are made safely and responsibly. These consumers, these businesses will stay underground uh, and consumers uh, and tourists will not travel to Vermont if these THC caps stay in place. So I know this has come up. We urge you guys to remove them. Uh, direct sales are the quickest and the best means to arrive at a safe and secure marketplace to curb use amongst youth and to normalize the plant amongst society in the state. Uh, a uniquely Vermont licensing structure and direct sales is also the fastest and the most viable path to arriving at a marketplace best prepared for federal legalization. And guys, this is gonna happen sooner than we realize. Um, so what do we wanna do? You know, ask yourselves, do we wanna spend a couple of years uh, with a corporate led marketplace uh, where we slowly bring in Vermonters over time, which other states have shown to not terribly be successful or do we wanna lead with Vermonters and be prepared for say the 8 million consumers that are beneath us in New York state on day one. Um, I just want to stress, guys, um, last September, uh, the International Drug Policy Consortium, uh, and I will share this link with you guys if you have not seen this report, uh, they work with the UN. They are a global entity. They issued a long and thorough warning, uh, a warning to countries, a warning to states and provinces in countries that there are efforts um, that in efforts to tax and regulate cannabis, quote, they say, markets have been captured by corporations and arts and are not set up to redress harms brought on by the war on drugs. Quote from the report, communities that have borne the brunt of the war on drugs are being excluded from these legal markets. Not only does this mean they don't benefit from these critical reforms, but these developments are serving to further entrench and exacerbate uh, inequalities. Uh, and again, uh, if you guys have not seen that report, I will share that. I think that is critical to the work that we do. Um, and lastly, uh, I'll end, uh, I had more to say, but I'm uh, truncating some of my, my statements. I will leave you with this anecdote. Uh, we all know Hill Farmstead. Uh, if Sean Hill was forced to sell his beer at wholesale to a corporate outlet, he probably never would have chosen to become a brewer. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Jeffrey, really appreciate it. Um, I'll, I'll certainly ask that you send us any data sets or, or other studies or <clears throat> whatever the case may be our way, we would love to see them. Dave Silverman, are, are you, are you with us? Hi, Dave. I, I appreciate, am. I appreciate you being with us and uh, apologies. We're running a little bit behind schedule, but if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself, I know you've been, um, fighting for this marketplace to exist for a number of years. So um, we're looking forward to, to hearing from you. Uh, uh, thank you. Um, th thank you, Commissioner Harris. And uh, thank you, commissioners, uh, for having me here. Uh, my name is Dave Silberman. I'm an attorney in Middlebury uh, since 2015, uh, around, around the same time that Chair Pepper started getting involved in, uh, in, in cannabis legalization legislation. Um, that's when I got involved as well, uh, working in the legislature, trying to help them shape their uh, policies and and uh, wind the way through the very complicated politics of of uh, getting us to where we are, um, and um, you know uh, we are where we are, and uh, now we need to figure out how to get this thing implemented. And I'm glad you're uh, you're having me here uh, to talk about that. Uh, and if if it's okay, I'd like to uh, share some slides. Absolutely. Do you, are you a are you a presenter now? Does he have uh, that functionality? I see. He should, yes. Okay. What, whether I know how to do it is a different so, story. <laughs> I get that. So there's an up arrow right next to the unmute mute button, the microphone. And if you hit that up arrow, a whole um, all your desktop options should come up and you just got to select the one that has the slides. Yeah, unfortunately, I get the share tray and the share tray is empty. Um, Nelly, is there any way you could maybe put up the slides that I emailed you since I can't? Absolutely, and that's uh, that's sometimes an error I get if I just close the um, the uh, program that I wanted to share and reopen it. Sometimes that works, but I've got your slides open and can share them myself. Okay, let me see if I can. Yeah, why don't you go ahead and get them up so that we don't um, waste time. Yeah, sorry guys. Don't be sorry. That happens to me all the time too. All right, there we are. Um, 
so uh, I, the title is, uh, here, here we are, we're, we're talking about empowering legacy growers to thrive in the regulated marketplace. And I think that's going to be, um, you know, something that's difficult for, for both sides. Uh, you know, legacy growers are, are used to working in an unregulated marketplace and regulators are not used to working with um, folks who have been um, working in that sort of shadow economy. Um, and so I have some uh, some specific thoughts and suggestions to uh, to go with uh, to present to you guys. We flip to the next slide. Um, I just want to present some uh, very quick disclaimers. Uh, first, uh, I do represent cannabis clients, um, but the opinions presented today are mine alone, not those of any clients. Uh, I'm not being compensated for the work in presenting this or preparing this. Uh, that's a lobbying disclosure. Uh, and finally, while I am an attorney, I'm not your attorney, uh, so nothing herein should be construed as as legal advice. Uh, thank you. Next slide. Um, I, the I, I've heard um, you know your your statements in your previous meetings, and 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 I'm really heartened by what appears to be some shared goals that we have, which is to create a, a regulated system uh, for cultivation and sale. Uh, that encourages existing suppliers to come into the market, that enables fair competition, that prevents big companies from monopolizing the market, that, that favors small cultivators over large ones, and, and that promotes equity uh, and environmental and social stability, uh, sustainability. Um, all of those things are really important, um, and we're driving my uh, advocacy work uh, leading up to Act 164. Um, next slide, please. Act 164 uh, gives the control board quite uh, a few uh, powerful tools. Uh, I want to talk about four of them specifically today. Uh, one will be the uh, small cultivator exceptions uh, powers that you have in Section 904A. Um, the other is uh, your authority to set licensing tiers under 901D2. Um, the other is um, your ability to enable uh, vertical integration uh, and not just under the integrated license type uh, combined with the one license rule. And we'll talk about that um, a bit as well. And finally, a, a real uh, passion project of mine has been limiting uh, the impact of prior criminal histories. Um, and uh, we've done quite a lot of work here. And I think you'll find that there's um, uh, some really powerful language uh, in the statute uh, to help you overcome uh, the disparate impact uh, that policing has had on, on certain communities in Vermont. Next slide. Um, the section, um, section 904A, I've, I've put some of it in front of you here, gives, requires you to make exceptions or accommodations where appropriate to small cultivators. Uh, and there is some express legislative intent baked right into that. Um, you want you are mandated by the legislature to encourage participation in a regulated market by small farmers. You're mandated by the legislature to move as much of the illegal market as possible into the regulated market. You're mandated to consider policies to promote small cultivators and, and consider the different needs and risks that small cultivators present versus larger cultivators. Um, and so those exceptions or accommodations are going to be really critical. Uh, and thankfully, uh, next slide, Nelly. Um, your authority under 904A is almost unconstrained. Um, it, it does say, 904A does say that you cannot grant those 904A exceptions with respect to environmental and land use requirements. I do include a but there. I want to get back to that. Other than that, all it says is the those exceptions must be appropriate. Um, that is your determination. That is your right to determine what is appropriate, acting reasonably in your uh, enforcement discretion. Uh, back to the environmental land use, land use requirements. While you cannot grant exceptions or accommodations under 904A, that doesn't mean that you cannot consider the different needs and risks. And that doesn't mean that you should stop um, thinking about how to promote through policy when you're writing your environmental and land, land use policies. It just means you can't do 904A exceptions. Um, and so, for example, when you're making recommendations to the legislature around land use, 
you might want to think long and hard about how it is that we encourage small growers, many of whom work out of their homes, right, out of barns, out of basements, out of maybe the, an extra room. Um, how do we make sure that they can continue to do that? Because if we require growers to rent a warehouse or rent a commercial building or change the way that they do business out of their residences today, they're just not going to come into this market. Um, another big thing that, that I hear from multiple growers that I've spoken with is, is if you make things too complicated for us, we will not come. Um, so step one is going to be making sure your applications are simple. This is a lesson that I think you can learn from California. Uh, their applications for small growers when they were trying to get, you know, the, the, the Humboldt farmers to come into the market that so far they have mostly failed. Um, in their applications, you know, there is a host dozens of standard operating procedures that uh, folks are required to present. Um, and, and these are, you know, when you're talking about uh, a, a side hustle, uh, when you're talking about somebody who's doing this uh, out of their home, not as their primary business, or maybe as their primary business as well, they're not going to have these things ready. And while certainly service providers like myself, lawyers, accountants, uh, consultants will be available, why require something uh, that, is, that is very expensive uh, for folks who are, uh, you know, by definition, very small? Um, so I, I think it's going to be very important to keep these applications simple and, and make sure that you're only asking for the information that is really critical for your licensing decision. What do you need to know? Who owns this operation? Where is it? What are you going to do there? You know, beyond that, to, to get into, you know, what your human resources policies are and, and, and things like that, that, that may be uh, very important for large operators, just becomes irrelevant and a paperwork exercise rather than an exercise in actually doing anything that helps consumers or helps transition small, small farmers into the market. Um, I also urge you to think about um, through your, your policy making powers to, to stand up some sort of support infrastructure for small growers in licensing and in compliance with, with your uh, rulemaking. Uh, some, somewhere where they can call in and, and get help um, on a you know, non-enforcement basis on really just how can we, the control board, help you, the grower, succeed? Um, and also, you, you have to keep fees low, especially non-refundable application fees. Uh, if those fees are high, they will not come. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, some things that, um, some specific areas where you can do some 904 exceptions, I think, to great effect uh, are around um, your your security requirements and also defining what an enclosed lock facility is. Uh, different growers today use different levels of security. Um, you know, somebody who's growing um, outdoors, um, you know, maybe they're using their geographical security. Uh, maybe they're just really far back from the road in an inaccessible spot. Uh, somebody who's growing in the barn in their house in a residential neighborhood probably has cameras. Um, I, I would just urge you to, to not be too prescriptive about the type of security and not require, you know, specific things like, oh, you have to have eight foot fences, you have to have key cards, you have to have cameras. Give people a menu of choices, let them present to you a reasonable security plan rather than mandating a one size fits all solution. And think about how you can encourage greenhouses um, you know, that is, there's some great environmental gains to be had there. Um, you know, you can extend the growing season without having to go fully indoors and, and, and using lights. Um, and think about how your security requirements might impact agritourism, uh, which I think is going to be an increasingly important part of small cultivators' overall business model, at least for some. Um, you know, you'll have, to, some folks will want to find a way to augment uh, their uh, wholesale level sales if they do not have a, a retail license. Uh, and another area, and by the way, feel free to jump in and stop me at, at any time if you have questions, want to get deeper into any of this, uh, or we can uh, talk some more at the end. 
Uh, another area um, is around packaging and labeling. You are required to put out some rules on packaging and labeling. With small growers, I really want to encourage you to allow growers to contract responsibility up the supply chain. Um, if someone is growing strictly for the wholesale market, making them be responsible for labeling their product for consumers is just, it's nonsense. They're not selling to consumers. They're selling to a retailer who will sell to consumers or they're selling to a wholesaler and further on the chain. And there's no need to make them uh, incur the costs of you know, these labeling machines or child resistant packaging. Uh, they should just be able to deliver in bulk uh, when they're going up the regulated supply chain. Testing. Um, this is one where you know it, it, there's a real struggle here to it, it, there's a real conflict between wanting to make sure that what consumers get is is clean and safe, which is a a, a huge um, priority of mine. Um, but but also we have to recognize that that especially early on we're going to see testing capacity be limited. Um, you know, I, I only know of a couple of labs in the state right now that are ready to apply for licenses. And if you don't allow some flexibility for small growers um, in testing requirements, you may accidentally be creating a bottleneck that really harms the small growers early on. Um, and finally, um, think about exceptions to seed to sale tracking. Uh, especially if you're going to mandate a costly software solution um, and, and perhaps think about ways to not impose that cost burden on small growers, uh, whether by giving them exceptions or working something out with the provider uh, so that the, the, the licensing fee, the software license fee is not borne by, by small growers who really can't afford it. Uh, and finally, uh, you know, you see me underlining there at the bottom. I, I, once the state of emergency is over and, and once you guys can get out in the field and talk with people, get out there, talk with people, not just the folks who are comfortable getting up here in front of you today, but get out there and, and visit hemp farmers, cannabis growers, and ask them, you know, show them what you're planning, show them what you're drafting, and ask them what they think. Uh, before you get to the point of, you know, official public comment. Um, next slide, please. Um, 904A has another provision that uh, I think has not gotten enough attention. Uh, it, it's a small grower jumpstart uh, in subsection D. Uh, subsection D says that upon licensing, a small cultivator may sell cannabis to dispensaries. This language, it, it, it's unique to small growers. It does not apply to other uh, licensees. So when, when uh, bigger licenses get, start getting issued a month later in June, uh, this doesn't apply. They can't start selling upon licensing. They can start growing upon licensing, but small cultivators can sell upon licensing. A and so there's some legislative history here. Um, and, and yes, this language is a little obtuse, uh, but what's it, what it's intended to do is to provide small growers an economic jumpstart, uh, particularly when the initial retail market is small. You're only going to have, you know, a maximum of five, probably more likely three integrated licensees selling to the public, uh, plus the, uh, the other uh, medical uh, outlets. That will be it in terms of the market uh, for the first five months that growers can sell into. Um, and, and so the legislature wanted to make sure that small growers, many of whom we know are already growing today, can take advantage of this market immediately. Uh, and, and in fact, they reiterated this via S25, which I guess I should update the, these slides to reflect its new act number since it's, it has been signed into law. Uh, S25 created an affirmative requirement that the dispensaries must purchase from these 904A growers. And you take that together, the only reasonable interpretation of this upon licensing language is that you, do, you are not to care where this initial batch of cannabis came from and why it is that it took no time to go from seed to sale. And so I really urge you to, um, to focus on this language and provide this economic jumpstart that the legislature intended by crafting a 904A exception.
uh, to seed to sale tracking for small growers in the initial licensing phase. Next slide, please. Um, this next topic, uh, the one license rule, I call it. Uh, Section 901D3, um, it, it, it does allow uh, for vertical integration and not just under the so-called integrated license. What it prescribes is horizontal monopolization. And so a person directly through affiliates can have one and only one license of each type, which means you can grow and you can sell uh, either to retail or you can be a wholesaler or you can be a manufacturer. You can have one of each of these licenses. Each license has its unique sets of um, authority of what uh, activities that are authorized. But um, you know, if you decide to be a grower, it doesn't mean you can't also be a retailer. Um, and, and it goes a little further. It also says that each license only allows one location. Uh, and, and the idea here was really to keep things small, uh, to avoid having you know, what we've seen, and there, there's a, an actual chain called Starbuds uh, in uh, Colorado and uh, Oklahoma. Uh, last I checked, they had 14 locations. I don't know how they didn't get sued by Starbucks for trademark infringement. Uh, maybe, maybe that day is coming, um, but that's not what we want here. We don't want McWeed, we don't want Starbuds. Um, we want small, local, independent. Um, and, and so this rule says um, you are to look past just record ownership. You're to look to beneficial ownership. You're to look to affiliates. Um, affiliates are defined not as 10% ownership, but also there's other uh, non-ownership or non-10% factors that could make someone an affiliate uh, of another person. Um, and so I, I urge you to take a look at this and think broadly about what are the indicia of control um, in, in the context of a, a licensee, uh, whether that be that licensees, executives and directors, very common in a securities law context. Um, I would urge you to set by rule uh, that franchisors are deemed to control franchisees uh, and that way you do not have franchises. Um, I urge you to dig deep into um, the corporate formation documents and demand that you see voting rights agreement uh, and operating agreements that have perhaps uh, corporate veto rights because, um, you know, somebody with a 9% ownership stake might in fact exert um, effective control over a company through voting rights or through veto rights. Uh, and also look to management contracts. Management contracts are very common. Um, or were very common in the medical marijuana space in Vermont um, when it was initially only uh, only uh, nonprofit companies were allowed to own licenses, uh, but those nonprofit uh, entities then entered into management company uh, management contracts with for-profit companies that actually operated uh, the uh, the dispensaries. Um, and you know you'd want to make sure that those sorts of uh, relationships, well, you know maybe they're fine. Uh, they're certainly controlling uh, because, you know, a, a management company can uh, direct the management or affairs of the licensee. Uh, finally, uh, this is, I think, a lesson we've learned from Massachusetts is you've got to make sure that the public has visibility into this stuff. Um, in, in Massachusetts, you know, they had a three license rule uh, and the way it was put into effect, I think, was very ineffective. Uh, nobody could really tell. And I don't think they went into the beneficial ownership level uh, either. So they, they didn't look to like, you know, trust and nominee arrangements and things like that. Um, so I, I really urge you to require deep, deep disclosure of beneficial ownership and uh, other aspects of control and make that information public. Um, I'll say this also on, on the just uh, the flip side of what I'm saying. If you require public visibility of ownership information, that may discourage investment, right? There may be folks who are willing to invest in this industry quietly um, and who would not be interested in doing so out loud. And I think there's a policy decision to be made um, as to what's more important for you guys, whether it's you know to make sure that people have ready access to capital in all its forms or whether uh, public visibility is more important. Next slide. 
Um, the Act 164 uh, has a few, um, just a few words about licensing tiers. Um, you're required to uh, set tiers for cultivators and you're required to set those tiers by size, although not clear to me that you're required to set them only by size. Um, and, and specifically, I know you're hearing from Intervale a little later today. I, 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 I want you to, to think about how you can encourage that sort of activity. Um, intervale style where you you can have a co-location of farms. Um, I, I think that, you know, that this one location per license does not mean one license per location. And, um, you know, there, there are some real opportunities to, for cost sharing, uh, for compliance cost sharing in particular, uh, if you allow uh, co-location. Now, um, there are other license types, not just cultivators, that you can, uh, and in one instance, must set tiers for. You are required by law to set tiers for retailers, uh, but it doesn't say how or on what basis. Um, so size, yes, uh, but I think risk is, is a much more pertinent factor uh, when you're setting tiers. Uh, and when I think of the risks the different kinds of retailers uh, can pose, well, you know, so there's consumable product, product that, you know, for a lack of, of better term, gets you high, uh, intoxicating products uh, versus uh, non-intoxicating products like most topicals, uh, you know, not transdermal uh, THC, but, um, you know, salves and bombs and things of that nature. So, for example, um, you know, today, uh, you know, I live in Middlebury, the Natural Foods Co-op has a nice lock glass display with CBD products, uh, including CBD salves. Um, and, you know, these are high value products uh, and it's a really nice way uh, to sell those and, and it creates a marketplace for our local hemp growers. Um, you know, that sort of retail activity is very different than selling flour, selling edibles, selling, uh, you know, other intoxicating products. And you might want to think about, in fact, I really encourage you to think about setting up a tier of retail license for non-intoxicating products. Uh, that can be very low burden, very, very low burden because they're not intoxicating products. Um, also seeds and clones and starts, um, you know, that's, that's, that's a different risk level. Uh, than a uh, full spectrum retailer, let's say, um, and um, also less uh, profitable, right? So, you know, you think about, um, uh, you know, I, I, I go to Greenhaven Nursery uh, to get my vegetable starts. Uh, maybe I can also go there for a cannabis start, or maybe I can go to the local grow shop uh, for a cannabis start um, or, or my seeds. Um, I don't necessarily need to go to the store where I also buy my edibles or my dried flour. Uh, and finally, there's got to be a way, th there has got to be a way to get cannabis into the small rural general stores that are dying all over the state. Uh, help us preserve this like small town commercial heritage, uh, allow them to have some kind of cannabis corner, uh, you know, figure out a way these people, they sell beer, they sell wine, they know how to check ID, uh, but um, figure out a way to, to have non-monoline retailers, um, especially uh, ones that, that we want for historical preservation reasons. Um, you uh, are not mandated, but have the discretion to set tiers for manufacturers and wholesales as, wholesalers as well. Um, I, when I think about manufacturing tiers, I, I I, I really want to think about risk, um, and I, I think there's a different risk level um, that extractors pose versus people who take extracted product uh, that, that take oil or, uh, or, or concentrates and use them to make another product. Um, and, and those are, I think, two very different license types uh, in terms of what kind of regulations are going to be applicable to them. Um, and there's probably room for different tiers of extractors as well, uh, because someone who's making bubble hash is going to be presenting a different level of, say, fire risk than somebody who's using ethanol extraction or butane extraction, which is not legal. Uh, 
So you don't really need to deal with that. Uh, for wholesalers, uh, one one type of wholesale tier that, that that comes to mind is is a grower co-op wholesaler. Uh, so th this would be a wholesaler that primarily buys from its member owners and uh, and and then sells it on into the retail market. Uh, you know that allows small growers to increase their their pricing power uh, by working together uh, and not not competing with each other. Um, and I think that's something that we really ought to encourage. Uh, kind of goes along with the the intervale style approach. Uh, and when you set tiers, you know you can absolutely vary your regulatory burden based on tier. Um, uh, but you can also vary your fees, and I think that's going to be very important. and And when you think about fees, please think about not just size, but but the type of of entity and and what kind of profitability they're going to have. So, for example, with with cultivation, you know, your indoor license fees could probably be three, four times higher than your outdoor license fees um, because that's, you know, they're going to get three, four times as much product uh, growing indoors uh, versus outdoors, just giving our short, given our short growing season. Next slide. Um, hey, Dave. Dave, I hate yep. to I hate to interrupt. Just just wanted to let you know that <clears throat> I know you started about five ish minutes behind schedule, but we're um, if you you could try and expedite so we can get our last speaker in before noon that would be fantastic but um i really want to hear the rest of your presentation but i'm just giving you a couple minute warning how about that perfect because this is my last slide all right um, there we go <laughs> uh finally uh here look we um we i worked very hard on this language that you see in front of you in the first bullet point um you cannot deny a license or a work permit to someone unless they presently pose a threat to public safety or the proper function of the regulated market. Uh, this language was put in in the Senate Judiciary Committee February 2019. Um, we worked on this language to focus on uh, the threat of violence uh, in the industry um, and to um, uh, root out organized crime influence. Uh, but we absolutely do not want to perpetuate the well-known, well-understood, well-demonstrated systemic biases that in the in the policing and prosecution system. And, and, and we know that, you know, if you are a black or brown Vermonter, you're three or four times as likely to be pulled over by a police officer. You're three times as likely to be searched once you're pulled over, even though you know, you're about one third as likely to have contraband on you. And, uh, you know, the, those biases just continue through the charging decisions to judges uh, and juries. And the end result is that, that Vermont has the absolute worst in the country, racial disparity in its prison population. Um, and, and, and so, you know, it's really important that you not use this bias to make a new one or to, to further perpetuate this bias by denying people with criminal histories licenses or the ability to even work through a permit in this industry. Um, and, and so we've made a lot of progress. Uh, we've, we, we've passed a law requiring the automatic expungement of cannabis misdemeanors. But, you know, there are many, many existing growers who have records that are, are still not eligible for expungement, whether because they're federal records or because they're, uh, they're felony records. Um, and, and we want those people in the industry. Um, and in fact, if, if we exclude them from this industry, what will happen is that this regulated market will fail. Uh, because the folks who are out there growing will just keep growing. Uh, they just won't be growing into the regulated market. Um, and so, um, you know, when you make your policies around, uh, you know, what is a present threat to public safety, um, <laughs> please don't be broad here. Uh, be very specific and be very narrow um, and, and let people get into this unless there's a real, real present risk. Um, so that's it. Next slide is just uh, my contact information and uh, any questions, happy to answer. Thank you so much, Dave. Really good stuff here. Um, Pepper, Julie, any questions before we move on to our last speaker before a public comment? Uh, I do have a question. Um, Dave, thank you for that presentation. I particularly enjoyed um, Slide nine, I believe it was around 901D and the recommendations you made there about uh, ownership um, and how we can vet that. Um, 
I, that was my original question that I had written down, and then here it was slide nine. There it was, but um, uh, I just uh, I, of course would love to talk to you about criminal history records. Don't really have the time for that. Um, I wanted to ask you about the legislative history behind um the prohibited products, um, and the concentrates and the THC caps. In particular, we've heard from a number of people that that's just going to perpetuate a black market or an illicit market for those types of products. Um, but I also know when the legislature has, you know, they'll create a study committee for things that they're open to, then they'll have prohibited products for things they're not open to. Um, so could you just talk a little bit about the legislative history behind those two, in particular, the uh, high THC or the THC caps or limits and the concentrates? And why those were, you know, um, kind of explicitly prohibited. There's, um, I think, two different um, topics here. One is sort of THC caps on uh, edibles, the five milligrams uh, per serving. Um, you know, that came out of uh, House Government Operations. Uh, we had talked about, um, you know, ten milligrams, which is what most states do. Five milligrams, which is what Massachusetts uh, uh, does. In fact, I, I passed around the table uh, some edibles from Massachusetts that I picked up the week before my testimony, and uh, you know, folks were, uh, you know, these folks in the committee do not have a whole lot of experience with with cannabis, and so they were able to see and touch and smell. Uh, none of them uh, ate, as far as I could tell. Um, so that was good because they, you know, trying to be professional here. Um, and um, so, uh, you know, the discussion kind of centered around, well, this is what Massachusetts does, the, the five milligrams per serving, uh, and sort of, you know, Massachusetts was the closest market to us. You know, Washington, Colorado, California were all 10 milligrams, um, and, uh, you know, they're kind of far away. Um, so that's kind of where that came from. Um, the, uh, ca the, the, the prohibited products, uh, the 60% cap on solid concentrates, uh, that came from uh, the, the health committee, the House uh, Committee on Health. Um, there was a lot of concern there. Uh, there also the 30% flower uh, cap came from there. There was a lot of concern, uh, you know, from the medical community uh, aired in that committee. Uh, and originally they proposed a 15% cap on flower. Um, and we, we talked with the committee about how that, you know, really would leave very little existing market uh, in the regulated market. We showed them, for example, from the medical dispensaries, uh, well over 90 percent of their sales of flour w was for flour over 15 percent. And so they, they understood. Uh, and, and I think they settled on 30 percent because that really does start to approach just sort of the natural maximum. That, that the flower can produce, uh, you know, the, the, some growers may tell you, oh, we, you know, I can go higher than that, but, but really can't get much higher than that. Um, and so that's where the legislature um, kind of settled on that one. Um, the 60% cap on concentrates, there, there's a really a lot of, I think, well-meaning, but uh, perhaps under-informed concern uh, around what high THC concentrates do to users, especially novice users, and, uh, you know, it, whether they are more addictive. And, you know, I, I was on the other side of, of this in, in lobbying. I didn't want to see these caps because I, I do think that the more you exclude from the market uh, a product that is popular, um, the more likely it is that, that the consumers who want that product will just continue to get it from their existing sources. Um, and, and that's not what we were trying to do here. Uh, but the legislature chose a 60% cap on solid concentrates, and that's solid only, right? So that's not liquids, that's not oils, um, it's solids. Um, and, uh, you know, in, in S25, you were asked to, to recommend something on that as well, uh, whether that solid concentrate cap should apply only to end user products. Uh, or also to intermediary products. And, and I really urge you to, to, to ask the legislature to shift their thinking at least on that intermediary product. Uh, because you know, what, what we see is uh, you know, uh, solid distillate, a powder distillate um, is a popular um, manufacturing ingredient. Um, and so some edible products, um, you, know, you don't wanna put oils in them um, and uh, so the, the, this powder distillate is, is what has sort of 
uh, come into the market uh, in other states, uh, gummies, for example. Um, and, and so if you require manufacturers to uh, dilute before they sell and then require then have bakers like undilute while they're baking, right, or, or whatever to take the water back out, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, and it just adds cost uh, and, and, and creates an opportunity for somebody to violate the law um, without providing any consumer safety. When at the end of the day, the product that they're going to sell is going to still have to comply with all of the other requirements like the five milligrams per serving. Uh, so I think, again, what the legislature was really concerned with was, you know, uh, dabbing. You know, they, they keep hearing these, these, these like really scary words, dab, shatter, you know. Um, and, and they don't know, and they're they're not really experienced. Um, you know, I can I, I can think of maybe two people on that committee and the health committee who might actually have some personal experience with dabs. Um, and um, you know, so you get suboptimal policy that way. Um, but in your recommendations, I would really urge you to um, to at least get them to to lift that cap for the intermediary manufacturing products. Thanks for that. Thanks, Dave. <laughs> So, Dave, really appreciate um, your 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 time with us this morning. It's been very helpful, and I look forward to continue to hear from you moving forward. Thank you very much. Appreciate the time. No problem. Uh, next, we have Jahela Dudley. Jeffrey, I know that your hand's up, unless you did that unintentionally. Um, I would really like to save comments you m may have from any presentations um, to be heard in our public commenting period because we're running about almost 20 minutes behind schedule. I understand that, Paul. I really appreciate it. I just want to bring up a point of clarity with what that previous guest had said, guys. There, there really is no um, natural ceiling for THC levels in plants. And I would urge you guys, if you do have industry uh, questions, to turn to the Vermont Growers Association. Our constituents are the industry players in the state. So I just want to bring up that point of clarity. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Jeffrey. Um, Jahela, uh, Nellie tells me that you're with us on the phone, um, and if you're I muted, am. oh, okay, you know how to unmute, great, Hi. sometimes, that can be a challenge. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, sorry I can't join via video. Um, I just moved to Plainfield, and my, my internet's pretty sketchy right now. Um, but well, thank, I am thank you for taking the time on the phone. Yeah. Um, I'll be pretty quick, uh, probably a little bit of a broken record. But um, just to introduce myself, my name is Jahela Dudley. I'm an owner of Fox Holler Farms. I've been in the cannabis industry for almost seven years or so in policy and growing in regulated markets in Colorado and regulated markets here in Vermont. And also my personal experience as a hemp farmer. Um, so I, I guess I'll say, you know, just to refer to Section 904, um, it was the intent of the General Assembly to encourage participation in this market by small local farmers. And as a small local farmer, um, it felt like the bill that was written did almost everything but. Um, however, I will acknowledge that the legislature put a lot of onus on the board to look into these barriers for small cultivators. And as Dave said, make exceptions, accommodations, recommendations um, to support these small growers and farmers. So I thank you guys. I thank James, Kyle, and Julie for arranging this today because it's so important. And, um, I, you know, I so appreciate that you're listening to our concerns and can move forward with them in mind. Um, I'm going to refer to a letter that I that myself and 60 small growers signed and wrote to the legislature back in February of 2020. We outlined a bunch of these concerns that we've been speaking about today, and I'll pull right from that letter. Um, my first concern in terms of barriers for farmers to join this market is just that, um, the ability for us to join that market. Um, in Act 164, there's a couple places where the wording talks about cannabis not being regulated as farming and cannabis produced from cultivation shall not be considered an agricultural product or crop. So unless a small farmer or a small grower is zoned as industrial, commercial, or not zoned at all, there's an immediate question mark and a barrier. Um, as most farmers in the state of Vermont are farming on agriculturally zoned areas, they are then at the whim of the town zoning officials to hopefully make a quick decision to allow them to cultivate. And 
as a lot of us know, zoning decisions are not quick. Um, and I will add, it's more than just a barrier. It's an unknown. It eliminates farmers' ability to plan. It leaves um, our hopes to participate in this market on a town timeline to get together and decide on zoning rules. Um, and just, you know, thinking about how that's been going with retail, it, it's a process. Um, the second thing, I was actually thinking a lot about this this morning. I took out a ruler and I measured um, what would be a thousand square feet. And I thought about it. Um, I thought about it like a farmer would think about it. And it was this, you know, we think about our inputs and our outputs, the cost of our inputs. We calculate nutrients, media, pots, equipment, labor, et cetera. Um, and just like any business, then we calculate how much we make. When I calculated the thousand square feet and I was visualizing where I would put my plants, my vegetative zone, my flowering plants, my clones, my stock plants, my drying and curing facilities, and the cost of doing that and the viable pounds that would come from that and be sent then to a retailer. Um, when I do this as a farmer, when I do this with other crops, like my tomato crops, my flower crops every year at the end of the year and figure out how much they've made, I then go on to cut what crops I should not continue growing because they're not making me money. And on a thousand square feet, I would cut the cannabis crop after the first year, or I would likely, you know, continue to grow that crop at a loss, hoping that one day I can get a larger license. Um, so that's just a barrier I would like to point out. And I know that's been already said. And then um, the last thing I will just touch on are the timelines. And although you know, I'm super happy with the legislature for accepting small cultivator licenses sooner than other licenses. Um, you know, the idea behind that was amazing. But for me, it feels like the efforts are in vain as the only outlet for those sales are through integrated licenses for the first few months of the market. So you're leaving my ability to sell my product in the hands of my competition a competition who has actually been legally ramping up production the last three months before licenses are even granted to them so that they can have their own, you know, their, their own pr production line. Um, so it, that is also, it just feels like an unknown there. You know, the, the way my product is spoken about, the way it's priced, the way it's sold, it's no longer up to me. So at that, point, at that point, you know, do I wait and lose five months of a, of a new market because I don't wanna sell directly to my competition? Or do I hope that my competition accepts my product and treats it and treats me with respect? So, you know, if I'm, if I'm gonna sell my tomato crop, I'd rather sell it to the local co-op than to the Shaws. And that's, you know, that's just, for me, that, that feels like a barrier um, to have to sell to the competition. Um, and then, and then I think that's it, because the last point I was going to make is just, um, you know, the THC caps on the flower. I do think it's going to be really hard to eliminate the dark market without that. Um, people want the products they want. So we're going to either regulate it or we're not going to regulate it. And, um, yeah, that's all I have to say. And, you know, there's lots more, but those, those are my biggest, just my concerns of, you know, the perspective of me as a farmer trying to join this market one day. Pepper, you got a question? Uh, Jahela, <clears throat> this is uh, James Pepper here. Um, thanks for joining us. And uh, thanks for all the advocacy you did on uh, Act 164. Um, <clears throat> my question really comes down to, we're, we're trying to, I think, crack this nut of prioritizing small cultivators while also providing a tested you know, clean, pure product uh, in the market. And I just, you know, I I just don't know how we get around the kind of testing bottleneck that we keep hearing about. And I was wondering maybe if you could speak to that a little bit, maybe from your experience in the hemp world or, um, or just, you know, how, what is the kind of minimum level of testing that you think that we could uh, require um, that would allow participation from small cultivators and still maintain that kind of consumer protection aspect of this that's so, you know, underlying the, the purpose of this law. Yeah, that's a tough one because it's, 
you know, other hemp farmer testing is super expensive. Um, and, you know, I think some of the language talks about every batch needs to be tested. Um, as a consumer, I want my, I want to know what's in my product. I want to know the percentage of THC. Um, but if you're asking a farmer to make, you know, 20 to 40 tests on a crop every session, that's, it's just not going to be affordable. Um, I don't know how to answer that question, James, but I, I might, I might think about maybe making a larger plan to have a, have a more robust state lab. I, I was going to say. Yeah, I was going to ask, is it, is it, do we request more investment in the state testing capacity to kind of even do like mobile testing? I don't even know if that's a possibility, but I, I'm just curious. This is an area that I feel like we need to really drill down into. Yeah, I mean, it, if testing is going to be a requirement and it should, um, you know, if I, if I don't care about what's in my product, I, I'm going to keep going to the dark market, but I, but I want to care about what's in my product. So I'm going to buy it legally. Um, yeah, I think it's just a resource problem at that point. You know, I, I, you know, the state lab has a pretty small capacity right now. I, I think the legislature should really be thinking about ramping up that capacity um, so they can act as a third party and state regulated testing lab. Um, and then maybe just making it, more accessible for smaller testing labs to move over to the THC market. Um, but yeah, it, it, that's a difficult one because it, it is really expensive. Jayla, bouncing off this conversation and, and a word or a phrase that you just used there is what I've been um, figuring out the best way to, to ask, which was third party. And I know depending mm -hmm. on your size and your scale, it's hard to really bring your own, you know, it, labs are, can be cost prohibitive to bring into your business, you know, um, and have your own type type of testing lab. I would imagine, though, yeah. if you do if you do make that investment, you balance that versus how much it costs to get third party tested. And depending on our regulatory structure, depending on other third party certifications that a certain business might carry from a organic or sustainable perspective, do you think? Um, third party testing is something that is necessary or depending on the right environment we're we're working in, would an would a consumer have confidence that a self-tested product would in fact, you know, carry um you know, would would that self-testing actually go anywhere with a consumer if it hasn't strictly been third party tested? Does that does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Um there are places in the state of Vermont that I would not trust what their their um, labeling says if they tested it themselves. And there are gr there are growers that I would totally trust <laughs> what their labeling requirements say. So it, th that's just such a hard one because yeah, you can you can put whatever you want on your you know if no one's going in and standing over your shoulder. I think third party testing is so important, but it's so expensive. So it's right. that it, that's a hard one. It really is. Yeah, and I'm just thinking how what are different different ways we can all achieve a goal. And I mean, yeah. I, there's a lot of confidence that would go into, you know, making sure that the a lab would be certified with the board. But you know that. You know, and it doesn't necessarily work for a small business setup because the the cost to actually set up that lab is is not necessarily a friendly one to to take on unless no, you're thinking no, you're way quite, out. Quite up there. Right. I I think you know I think from a consumer stand standpoint, um, obviously I want to know the percent of the of the THC, but um, more importantly, you know if if there's contaminants chemicals that I don't want in my product. Right. Yeah. We're we're right at we're right at the top of the hour. Um, I see Josh and, and Jeffrey have their hands up. I might give them a minute each. I'm sure that they thought about this this bottleneck. So um, and then we want to then I'm going to turn it back to you, Pepper, and, and you can help uh, manage manage the public comment period if that works for you. But Jeffrey or Josh, feel free. Yeah, thank you. And uh, I'll be brief. I just wanted to respond to the question about mobile testing. So gas chromatography, HPLC, you know, et cetera, et cetera, testing. Uh, those are big, heavy machines, and their bigness and heaviness is what makes them accurate. So 
it's uh, super important um, that it's done in a, in a real lab setting if you want real accurate results. There's lots of people working on mobile testing equipment, but none of it really meets the same uh, accuracy or standards as a lab. I want to underscore the importance of third party testing, though. That's very important. The medical community in the state has really suffered because that hasn't been a requirement in medical mm -hmm. dispensaries. When I started growing medically, it was for patients who were getting sick off of the products they were purchasing in the dispensaries here. Another important uh, thing to consider when we think about, you know, multi-state operators and the medical uh, medical permits here versus the new growers, they've already kind of proven that their quality is subpar and not really what people need from a consumer health perspective. Um, and then lastly, uh, you know, I think uh, maybe there's some kind of subsidized testing program for social equity applicants or for small farmers or something like that that could um, uh, be really important because it's not a, this cost is not prohibit, uh, a problem for larger publicly traded companies, um, but it could be for small farmers. So uh, maybe there's stipends or something like that, but just throwing it out there. Thanks, Josh. Jeffrey, can I ask you to be brief? Certainly, I just wanted to follow up on testing um, as well. Uh, thank you uh, for raising it. Uh, and I wanted to follow up because we've been um, communicating with other state advocacy organizations and they offered some insights into this arena, um, notably Massachusetts and uh, California. Uh, there is a white paper that I'm happy to share, uh, which uh, pretty much includes our recommendations for testing. We do. Uh, suggest the state gets involved uh, and also certifies labs as well. Um, but we recommend testing cannabis for water activity and for specific uh, pathogenic organisms rather than microbial activity in general, uh, as some states do. This is seen as a barrier to entry for small businesses. Uh, microbial activity in general is sometimes referred to as TYMC or total yeast and mold count uh, or uh, aer aer uh, aer aer aerobic uh, plate, uh, plate count. Basically, um, I would urge you to look at um, California and Oregon. Uh, they do not uh, practice total yeast and mold count, and that is a more accessible and somewhat moderately, moderately successful testing regime for uh, small businesses. Uh, so again, I would turn uh, urge you guys to look at California uh, and Oregon. I believe Colorado and Nevada do test uh, and have overbearing uh, testing regulations for small businesses. Uh, and again, happy to share those resources and that white paper with you guys as well. Yeah, that would be great. Please, please do. Thank you, Jeffrey. Uh, Pepper, I'll turn it back over to you for the public comment. Mm -hmm. Period. Great. Thank you. Um, so that was a great um, group of witnesses. Uh, we have 10 minutes uh, scheduled for public comment right now. We'll have another 10 minutes this afternoon. So uh, if anyone would like to speak, please, we're going to start with the folks that are not on the phone that have clicked the link and um, only because you can raise your virtual hand and I can see that and we will um, then move to the people on the phone. Um, again, if you're on the phone, you can unmute yourself by star six. When I move to the people on the phone, I'll let you all know um, and um, we can start. Um, I see, I'm just gonna go in the order that it looks like they popped up. Um, and I'm gonna limit it to just a couple minutes each, um, just because we will have public later this afternoon. But um, David Templeman, why don't you go ahead? Can you unmute yourself? Yeah, hi, uh, thank you for taking me. Uh, Pepper, you had a question that wasn't answered uh, early in the presentation. Perhaps I can uh, shine a little light on. You were asking if there would be enough capacity within uh, the small cultivator community to supply the state with the projected market. And um, I think the question isn't, is there going to be enough? I think the long-term question is, will there be an oversupply? Um, I believe that uh, the small cultivator community on its own would be enough to supply the state, absolutely. Um, we also should be cognizant that perhaps we have an oversupply as we've seen happen at, at certain times and places in other states. Uh, coming from Northern California myself, uh, there have been several um, market uh, moments where uh, there was more cannabis than people knew what to do with. And I think that's something we have to be very careful to avoid here because that could be the downfall of the same groups of people we're trying to support in and get into the marketplace as cultivators. If they come into the, the, the small cultivator market, 
um, and, and produce a good product, but they can't sell it because of oversupply or can't get a good price for it. Um, I think that this also needs to be a, of great concern to uh, Cannabis Control Board. Um, one, one other quick point, and I know we're limited on time. Um, you know, what we're talking about here for the small cultivator, for the small business person, is entry point. The ability to get into the market um, in the first place and, uh, you know, making it easier for, for the little guy to get in. And I just want to um, draw a parallel, a correlation between um, what people here are calling uh, a sustainable practices. I'm, I'm calling it regenerative cannabis, um, regenerative cannabis practices, organic soil, outdoor um, you know, carbon se sequestration, a Korean natural farming practices. These are the um, the 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 smallest um, uh, capital cost uh, um, ways forward. So the same things that are best for the environment are best for the small cultivator coming into this from a capital cost perspective. I think that's all. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, David. Um, next, it uh, looks like it was Amelia. Yeah, hi, it's good to see you guys. Um, I usually talk about the medical patients, but I just wanted to bring up what I felt was kind of an obvious point, but I haven't really heard talked about. Um, and that's that current legal medical caregivers are already small farmers um, at a very small scale, granted. <laughs> um, but they already have their facility set up. These are oftentimes indoor grows. They're small. Um, they've got two mature plants and they're doing this for free uh, because they can't legally be compensated for the product that they're growing. So I think that in crafting these license structures, um, it would be, it's imperative to consider how to integrate the pre-existing caregiver cultivators into those small farmer licenses because they are already small farmers uh, and that was the only point i wanted to make Th thank you for uh thank you for that thank you um and just for your benefit you know we're we're breaking these kind of you know priorities of act 164 and s25 into kind of more manageable chunks recognizing that they are all integrated um you know they it's hard to really separate um some of these issues from one another but um thank you for for that comment um next on my list i see um stephanie lingerfelter lingenfelter oh hi i'm trying to get the the hello can you hello. hear me yes hi everyone yeah. thanks for being here um, first, I wanted to say, introduce myself. My name is Stephanie Lingenfelter, and I really appreciate all, what everyone has shared so far today. I'm not new to this topic, but I'm new to this forum. I'm a licensed alcohol and drug counselor, a licensed K through eight school counselor, a rostered clinical mental health counselor, as well as an herbalist. And this is also, and I'm also a single mother, and. I am a survivor of domestic and sexual violence. And so I'm also a medical cannabis patient because of complex PTSD and other physical ailments. So I have a lot to share on this subject of liberating and legalizing cannabis. So if I don't get to it all today, I hope to connect with all of you to come up with a, another plan for that. And so I also have, few businesses, one of which is a hemp business, and this is my first summer farming hemp. And so as a small business, you know, a single parent and someone just entering the industry, I have learned a lot in the past couple of months about the corporate monopolies and a lot of the small farmers in Vermont, as well as being an herbalist. A lot of the herbalists you know, we can't really make a living just growing and selling things like vegetables or basil or calendula and giving us access to being a part of the market is really essential um, on a lot of different levels. And so I took a bunch of notes throughout this morning and I just wanted to try to address some of those things. Um, one of which that really is standing out right now is that $100,000 licensing application that, you know, cuts me 
out of the market when it comes to being able to grow craft cannabis and sell that from my herb shop that I have here above my garage, my apothecary. Um, so I wanted to mention that from, from my perspective, as well as the security and the affordable testing. And one of the ideas that I had for the affordable testing was as we were talking about the composting of the plant material, I'm wondering if there's a way for the state to organize or help organize some type of a business or nonprofit that can go throughout the state and collect that um, and create compost out of it for the growers. I think there's a lot of ways that we can get creative um, and collaborate together between the small growers and the states. And the money, the revenue that comes from things like that can be put into the equity programs um, as well as things like preventative education. Um, so I know some of the issues are about labeling and people still, a lot of the public, there's still a lot of stigma around cannabis use and a lot of misinformation. So I think that there's a way to educate the public and keep the youth safe. For example, my nine-year-old son, he can open any pill bottle in the house, any child safety pill bottle. A lot of these kids that I've worked with as a counselor, as well as parents that I've worked with um, on, you know, with addiction, recovering from opioid use disorder and other, a lot, you know, more detrimental substances, cannabis has been one of the few things that has, have helped them to stop abusing illicit substances, you know. I would be a lot more worried about my son getting into a bottle of benzodiazepines or a bottle of liquor or, you know, a any type of opiate than I would cannabis. Um, yeah. And well as with the, those situations when it comes to the THC caps, I also don't think that that's a useful thing because that's going to, again, feed the, uh, you know, the illicit market and sure. the out of state market. And that takes away from what we're able to tax as Vermonters and put back into the community, you know, as well as when you open those gates for illicit cannabis, you're also open op illicit cannabis products that also opens the gate for more illicit substances of other kinds to come into Vermont. Right. Um, All right. Well, thank you, Ste so, Stephanie. I have a lot to say, so I, I hope uh, we, can... we, we are going to have another public comment period um, later this afternoon. Um, I'm just trying to give people somewhat equal time um, to the best I can. But thank you for those thoughts. Um, you know, everything that you're saying, you know, we're, we're, we're taking in and we're kind of in a fact finding stage sure. right now as a cannabis board. So, so thank you for that. And um, please, you know, stay tuned. And uh, I know as a single mom, this probably isn't the best time for you to participate. So we're going to try and work on a flexible meeting schedule as well. Um, but uh, thank you for your input and um, please stay in touch. Um, the next person that I see on my list um, is Caitlin. Um, Caitlin, if you have your hand raised, can you please um, unmute and provide public comment? Hello. Um, I, uh, I'm not going to put a video on because I'm in the country with no internet. Um, but one thing through taking notes from earlier, one of the things you said was or asked was, would small growers be able to fulfill the market? And I also wanted to agree that we absolutely 100% could fulfill the market. It's just all about how much access you give us to be able to enter the market. And there's right now, I would say it's pretty stringent and difficult, but I think that farmers, small farmers are willing to try to investigate if, if it's possible for them. But uh, so I wanted to say I'm 100% small growers can compete in the state. Uh, the other thing I wanted to bring up is testing. And I'm very concerned what uh, caps on testing, regulations on testing really mean, because the most important thing to me for testing is molds, bacteria, negative bacteria, not KNF farming, but bad bacteria like pests and diseases that you wouldn't, wouldn't want in your lungs or your body. But caps on uh, THC content and CBD content, all that spectrum, that seems very that seems like the bottleneck that you're creating. I feel like when you open it up, 
and you allow the market to decide what people want, then you'll find access easier for people to get into the market. But by creating walls at the beginning, people aren't people are going to be afraid to enter because there will be added costs and po potential for not even being able to sell something that you worked very hard to grow. So I think that a lot of these walls that you've put up are dangerous for allowing access to small farmers, but maybe you can eliminate them. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you, Kaylin. Thank you, Kaylin. Is there anyone else um, uh, who joined by the link um, that can that wants to raise their hand? And okay, uh, Charles. Hey, how's it going? Um, I just wanted to ask if it's possible to get some feedback. Um, how? likely is it that somebody you know with let's say forty thousand dollars in their pocket um and some knowledge of how to grow could actually enter the market you know with all of your setup you know the the, the legal loopholes you got to jump through to do it right all the fees the the facility a reasonable amount of equipment um, you know, do you think it'd be possible for somebody who's like saved up 40 grand, let's say, to enter the market? Um, Charles, we're not really in a position to be answering questions um, as a board at this point. Um, and but I will just say that we um, need to set reasonable fees. We've been given the um, authority to make accommodations um, for small cultivators and um, social equity applicants. Um, and so um, our fee structure will reflect the legislative intent um, of the bill and those priorities. Um, but uh, we really need to um, just kind of hold off on making any um, comments publicly about any of our fee structures, um, especially considering we haven't uh, even had an opportunity to, to discuss them as a board. Um, is there are there any other public comments uh, from um, either people on the phone or people um, that have joined through the link? And again, to unmute yourself, you press on your phone, you press star six. Um, Caitlin, is 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 your hand up from before, or is that is this an, a new comment? Um, it is a new comment. If I'm allowed to, I know you guys want to wrap it up. Yeah, we're trying to wrap it up. Do you think it could be just you super know quick. super okay. quick? Okay. Yeah. So my fear, another fear of testing that I have is that people will seek out labs that give them certain numbers when you put caps on things, and so. Third party testing is great, but currently people will absolutely seek out specific labs that give them the numbers that they want, which is another reason why a state lab that's way more robust and, you know, is going to be important. And I hope that it'll lead to subsidizing small growers that can then get tested in a more accurate way. Okay. okay that's everything. Thank you. And uh, I guess the last comment here would be from the Vermont Grow Shop, St. Albans. Hey, how you guys doing? Um, <clears throat> so I just wanted to say that there's a lot of intelligent conversations going on today, and I had a list, and the White River guys pretty much uh, covered all the questions. And I just wanted to say I concur with pretty much everything they said, and we're up north <clears throat> taking care of the growers. So I just wanted to chime in and say thank you guys, and uh, hopefully we'll see you soon. Great, thank you. So um, next on our agenda is to take a, a lunch break. Um, we'll be back. Uh, we have some more witnesses this afternoon. We'll be back at 1240. Um, that's about 20 minutes from now. And uh, I'm wondering, Nellie, if you could pop up our kind of away message and um, stop the recording while we take a quick break. Yes. 
I can. One second. Yep, recording is pending, should start momentarily. All right, we are recording. All right, so welcome back. Um, it's 1240. Um, Kyle, uh, we got a few more witnesses this afternoon. Um, if they're around, I'll just hand things back over to you. Yeah, great. I think Nikki's with us. Nikki, are you with us? I am. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you so much, Nikki. Nikki is a business planner with the Intervale Center. I'm sure most folks that are with us here today know what the Intervale Center does, Nikki. Um, I would imagine, though, that depending on um, you know what other diversified streams of income some folks that have operated in the illicit market um, you know have might not be familiar with all of the services that the Intervale Center does afford you know, clients that it that it undertakes or takes on. Um, so I would what I was hoping um, is that you could give us kind of an overview how the Intervale Center looks to to hopefully uh, lend a, you know, a business thinking perspective to, you know, the big equation that goes into to forming a successful business when there's an emerging market. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I guess first and foremost, you know, thank you, James, Julie, and Kyle, uh, for wanting to hear from business planners, you know, such as us, um, and just about the services that we offer, like you said, Vermont producers and growers, and how that can extend to cannabis growers. Um, and to just to carve out just some space and acknowledgement um, that we really support um, this process um, and the board's goals that you've already stated. You know, to ensure equity, special racial, especially racial equity in fairness and how best to implement these regulations um, and access to this new industry. Um, you know, as farm service providers, we too have goals of improving access, uh, you know, to land and capital mostly that we work with with our farmers, including BIPOC and the small scale growers, um, and just acknowledge that there are those historical in inequalities of access to those resources. So just, again, a, a quick, uh, <laughs> quick, right? But, but a, a thank you again for this process. Um, so yeah, I'd like to just you know do a little bit of an overview of our business planning and kind of how our services you know can be accessed um, by cannabis growers. Um, so at the Interville Center, we have a three a team of three uh, farm business specialists, including myself. Um, we work one on one with farmers, um, and when I say one on one, I, I mean that our services are individualized and quite tailored to that particular farmer's needs. Um, whether that farmer is an aspiring, beginning, experienced, or even exiting or retiring, um, we meet farmers where they're at. And I think that, you know, is something that um, is unique to some of the other business planners and organizations and programs out there. And, and we think we excel at that. Um, you know, our planning process at its core is pretty consistent, project to project, farmer to farmer. Um, that is, support the farmer in identifying and reaching their goals and help them build that management capacity and confidence to make decisions. Um, kind of just baseline, that's our process. Um, you know, we help them understand their financials, the knowledge to run their business, and ultimately be able to do strategic planning. Um, of course, when we first meet a farmer, you know, their needs are pretty much more immediate than say wanting to do strategic planning, right? But, um, you know, as we work together and develop that service provider farmer relationship, over time, we build trust, and that trust gets carried over to those more longer-term planning. You know, where maybe the business time horizon is looking out to five years, ten years, um, or even working with a beginning farmer and talking about retirement or exit strategy. But being being able to have those conversations. Um, but I guess regarding more of the immediate needs and kind of the services, um, you know, that that we provide. Um, generally, we see farmers reaching out uh, for their, you know, search for land and help, um, how to finance that purchase or, you know, build security and equity if there is a leased land arrangement. Um, you know, we work with farmers and kind of talking through them taking on a new enterprise or wanting to scale up an existing enterprise. Um, maybe they're wondering about the profitability of doing that. 
um, and maybe just not diversifying farm products, uh, but maybe they have questions about diversifying, you know, their market channels as well. And so we look at some market analysis. Um, we help write business plans, cast financial projections, um, you know, talk a lot about, about analyzing risk and talking through a farmer's tolerance for that risk and their capacity to carry debt service. Um, you know, our basic goal for them is to, to help build up their financial literacy, essentially. Um, again, regardless of project type, uh, regardless of a farm's operation or production system, uh, farm size, or even the farmer themselves, uh, we really value that we work with everyone. Um, and our process, again, at its core is the same. Um, and I would say too, you know, what makes this work successful um, is that trust that, you know, is built between us and the farmer. Um, and then also kind of the expectations that we set with them from the start. Um, you know, we, we, we say you get out of the process what you put in. Um, we won't make decisions for you, but we will provide the information for you to make informed decisions and that we ask for honesty and transparency. Um, a lot of this information is sensitive and, you know, we have that confidentiality, um, but we do, you know, ask for transparency. Um, so, right, like how does this, you know, all fit with a cannabis grower um, into our services? Um, you know, I'd say that the quick answer would be that we'd say that a cannabis grower would be able to access our services just as any grower would. Um, again, because our you know business planning service with them would be the same. But then there is that longer, more complicated answer, of course, and that's why we're here to kind of figure that out. Um, you know, the differences would be the level of um, industry knowledge, market, our regulatory understanding you know, cultivation experience that we are pretty limited in offering. Um, you know, we're just starting to have that conversation amongst ourselves to identify opportunities for our professional development um, and possible partnerships. Um, you know, the Interville Center is a nonprofit organization, so our funding portfolio is diverse. Um, it does include federal funds, um, but it also, you know, we have private funding that would allow us to work with cannabis growers. Um, we're also part of the larger farm viability network of business planners in the state. Um, and I'd say a few of them are in the same position as we are to take on cannabis clients. So I'd say, you know, insert here an opportunity to consider some grant funding. Um, so folks, you know, have that access to the greater reach of business planners and consultants in this network. Um, you know, and then not just business planners, but kind of all the additional technical assistance and professional services, um, you know, that we wouldn't be able to support and connect growers to that we usually get to with other producers um, at this time. And especially, you know, looking out for the smaller scale growers who probably wouldn't have these folks in-house on their payroll. So just being able to give them access. Um, you know, we're excited about this opportunity and what it can mean for Vermont farmers. Um, and also to kind of what we all have learned and gleaned from from our most recent experiences with, with hemp and CD, uh, CBD in the state. Um, so I, I guess I'll just kind of end there and take any questions. James or Julie, do you have any questions? Um, I, I do have a question and I, um, I'm i not sure if I'm asking the right person, Nikki, you can tell me if there's somewhere else I should direct this, but are there, um, certifications or well i guess certifications that people who are farmers or who are interested in the cannabis industry can get that maybe don't require a bachelor's or any kind of undergrad that would be a certification of value yeah i in terms of you know business expertise or 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 agricultural expert expertise yeah um you know, there are some farm programs um, that, you know, a farmer, I think it's through, you know, UVM can go through um, that has a more of a, a curriculum. Uh, NOFA, Vermont has uh, farm programs that, you know, take farmers over the course of, you know, a few months and they build up a, a cohort and kind of go through business management, production management. Um, so I, I think more of the you know, those resources that are offered in the state through organizations that, you know, um, deal with more of the, 
the the trainings um, and I guess less so of you know bachelor degrees and, and such. You know, it's it's, an, it's interesting. We do even regarding cannabis inquiries. Um, most recently, we're finding that a lot of the the new entry folks who who want in on this come from you know business degrees and you know building up business plans and they have a really tight, um, really detailed outlay of what they want to do and the numbers behind it. But then they're missing that production and cultivation experience where, you know, other growers that we work with is kind of flipped. You know, they have worked on farms for other farmers and they're ready to take on, you know, as business owners themselves. And they're now missing that business management um, piece. So I think it's it's connecting to, you know, the the wealth of resources and consultants, you know, in the state, as well as on the ground trainings and experience. Um, so, I, yeah, I think there's not just one path, um, one um, certification or, or background, you know, academic program. Um, it's just, you know, connecting these farmers, these growers to like the right suite of, you know, support teams. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thanks for joining us. This is um, James Pepper. Um, it's hard for me to articulate this question. You know, our overarching goal here is to um, try to break down as many of the barriers to entry and, uh, for small cultivators and for the legacy market to get into the regulated market. You know, we've been hearing just uh, so much about the importance of third party testing, but that that being such a barrier. Um, and you know we heard earlier from um some folks that were talking about maybe cultivators kind of forming a cooperative and it's not really a cooperative but it's kind of like being under the umbrella of common grow practices and trying to you know do a little bit of i don't want to say self-policing but kind of just keep you know having common practices that they all are um kind of adhering to and have you seen that model in Vermont and is it working? Um, and is that something that we can rely on kind of some sort of maybe voluntary commitment with some maybe some compliance testing that's not quite as intense as uh, a full kind of regulatory scheme? Yeah, I think, you know, UVM Extension does a, a wonderful job at, um, you know, educating farmers and providing kind of these trainings for food safety, water quality, being GAP certified, all that that may entail, um, you know, and kind of re related to this a little bit, you know, just this uh, notion that, you know, this industry, I think, in past has been very proprietary, um, you know, and maybe not as transparent. And, you know, however, these farmers can understand, you know, best growing practices. Um, I think the work that we do with other farmers, with other organizations, with other business planners, there's just this collaborative nature, um, you know, that is could be kind of foiled that that proprietary feeling. Um, so I don't know if I have the best answer for you, James, but I think kind of bringing in as many resources, you know. Uh, uh, research facilities, uh, you know, UVM extension, um, business consultants, and kind of having this collaborative nature that it's, you know, yes, all, they're all in, com you know, competition with everyone, um, but there is a sense of collaborativeness. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> hey, Nikki, this is Kyle. Thank thanks again so much. And um, I totally ag agree, and it's so great that the interview kind of looks at a, pers a perspective person's background and what they do well and tries to complement what they do well with with the other necessary pieces to really having a successful business and one that can grow smart and manageable over time and, and hit those goals. I just, um, you know, w you mentioned business planning um, a couple times and kind of your 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 suite of services overview and you know, in my former role at the agency of ag, you know, I, I helped review a lot of grant applications and I'm hopeful that as, as if we can really move 
um, this on an agricultural trajectory, especially from a small cultivator perspective, there's going to be hopefully opportunities with, you know, various grant opportunities that are state funded in state. And I know business plans that are recent, that are fresh, that are realistic are a huge part of how you you go or you review grant applications. And a lot of those grants have to be or excuse me, all those applications have to be for something that's innovative or doing something new or helping the supply chain in and around whatever whatever sector of agriculture you're working in. So, and, and one of the things that I think is a common theme that we, my fellow board members and myself and the, and the public all kind of come back to is there's a lot of, um, there, there, there could potentially be issues with raising enough capital um, to really find success here. And it's hard to think about it as capital because usually usually you have your your ducks in a row and you go apply for a grant and um, you know, you, you're not really in the startup phase per se when you're looking for a grant. But but from your perspective, uh, hopefully there will be grant opportunities for for uh, cannabis growers in the state. But, but what makes and I know applications are different, but in, in addition to business planning and a business plan per se, what other tools does the Intervale really have that can I know I don't think you guys grant right or anything like that, but but what other tools might you have that can help folks find uh, access to funding? Yeah, that's that's a great question. Um, you know, we we do, you know, don't outright say that we will write, you know, grants for for folks and for projects, um, but we do assist in that, you know, editing or, or kind of coaching, um, reviewing applications. Um, it, I think as much as you know, a grant application, I would compare it to, um, you know, securing a financial loan through, you know, say like the FSA or USDA or any other farm credit or kind of that institution. And that comes with kind of a, an application package where, yeah, you have the, the business plan that's needed. You have financial projections. You have some another, you know, other analysis that um, kind of go hand in hand. Um and I guess kind of outside of those those hard skills and services that we would offer, um, you know, just kind of understanding the scope of a, a project that's needed, um, that's being applied for, and being able to being able to ask, you know, the hard right questions. Um, you know, it may seem really great, maybe seem too lofty on paper, and we're able to push back a little bit. Um, so, yeah, and I think, again, I'm just going to keep, you know, underlining and underscoring this collaborative, um, you know, great quality that I think Vermont offers growers. Um, you know, even I, I mentioned the Farm Viability Network, and I, you know, I tell farmers, you know, if you're not just working with me, you're working kind of with everyone in this network and beyond. Um, you know, again, I mentioned earlier that, we usually are able to support uh, financially, uh, just connecting to resources, those other additional technical assistance, um, you know, connecting farmers to, um, you know, tax accountants or bookkeepers or legal services. Um, so even though we necessarily don't provide that in-house, um, you know, we have been able to to offer that to, to farmers. And again, can't necessarily do that right now uh, to cannabis growers. Um, but hopefully in, in the future, or as maybe additional funding allows, um, we're able to to be able to offer that as well to, you know, make for a very successful application to to those grants. Yeah, um, thank you so much. And I'm, I'm so pleased to hear that, that the Intervale has that ability to kind of compartmentalize certain funding streams to really um, you know, help these growers recognizing that uh, an entity that's federally funded We'll hit a lot of roadblocks when it really comes to helping out this this emerging sector. Um, I also know Nikki that obviously regulations, market analysis, really in input a lot of or are necessary for you to really do your job effectively. And so that puts you know some some onerous on us to one get some things out the door. We need to refresh our mar our market analysis um, from 2015. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, you know, given that we need to do this work as a board and we also need to educate the service provider community mm -hmm. on regulations to make sure that that you understand expectations X, Y and Z 
Um, I'm wondering when would, and it sounds like you might have heard from some folks interested in, in and moving into this emerging market, legalized market already, but but when would be a good time considering everything for folks to kind of really start uh, engaging with the intervale? You mean as, as growers or as? Yeah, as, as you know, if let's say a person X is interested in growing the intervale and this person knows that all of they're still so much to be figured out. What is it worth it to reach out to you tomorrow or should they, you know, wait? I don't know. You know, you know what I'm trying to say? Like I'm trying to. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, I say, you know, the business plan itself, the implementation of it, securing financing like that of all those hard deliverables, you know, that can wait, I guess, until, you know, you know, when it is legalized, um, I think the business planning itself can can happen now. I, I, you know, we are, like I said, having these recent conversations with our leadership team and financial team just to really, you know, I guess our lawyers as well, just to ensure that everything is is OK moving forward. Um, but just like CBD, um, you know, it just is kind of like checking off our, our boxes. But just in terms of business planning, um, you know, I think in the next few weeks into fall, like that is something that, you know, we can start we can start helping out with. I, and and I, I pushed it out to the fall just because, again, you know, talking through some potential partnerships and our need for professional development as service providers, um, you know, we just wouldn't want to steer anyone in the wrong direction just because, right. you know, we have yet to, to really fully realize the needs and, you know, the even just, you know, expenses that, you know, we are just un, unaware of, um, you know, what all goes into a production system. Um, and so, you know, give us a little bit time to, to catch up and, and learn as much as we can. Um, so I would say, you know, into the fall would be a good time. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> that makes that makes good sense. Um, uh, James or Julie, do you have any other uh, further questions for Nikki? Hi. <clears throat> I'm curious, uh, Nikki, you know, we hear a lot about um, the larger grow operations uh, that are going to be all indoor um, and the kind of issues that come, the energy issues, and environmental issues, the negative consequences of that. Um, do we have examples of large scale grow operations in Vermont uh, that you know of that are all indoor or all hydroponic? Um, you know, not not uh, necessarily cannabis, but uh, other agricultural products. Yeah, there there are a few around. Um, you know, there's a, a former vegetable grower um, in the Charlotte area who now has turned, um, I believe, into to CBD production. Um, and we've seen plans for you know, like a passive solar or you know, kind of that greenhouse all glass. Um, we're talking to growers who want to do more of an enclosed, you know, um, you know, grow light system um, that, you know, it's the examples might be there, um, yeah. but probably we're, we're quite limited into kind of on the ground examples for the types of, I think, production systems and styles and efficiencies and scale and of what probably the most like efficient, profitable um, operation would look like. Um, but just again, yeah, being aware of, like you said, um, kind of the resource demand uh, for those types. So is there is there a balance? Is there a way that Vermont can, you know, ease some of those um, environmental resource demands, um, you know, the way that we've done, you know, other energy intensive um, systems, I would imagine. Yeah. But then too, you know, just even the most recent um, kind of uh, request from a farmer for our services uh, for cannabis growing, you know, their their business plan and business model was very aware of, of that and, and wanting, you know, to to distinguish themselves in the marketplace as, you know, whether being, you know, net energy or you know, highlighting their product, but the services, you know, connected to those products, that that quality, there's a story of environmentally friendly. And um, so I think growers are aware of that demand um, in trying to, you know, um, kind of have their products have that kind of identifier that 
they've thought that through and um, try to close the loop on some of those energy, you know, loops and reduce their, their footprint. Yeah. Julie, go ahead. Um, I'm just wondering when, you know, in farming in general, um, because we've heard a lot of different types of farming and size of farming, what is the, from your experience, Nikki, what is the biggest barrier for someone who's interested in getting into growing anything and then and, and to getting to the point where they can operate a business? Yeah, um, you know, I think we've, we've seen that the biggest barriers is access to land and access to capital. Um, and of course, with cannabis, um, you know, access to access to land, it could be leased land and it could be hesitancy by the landowners to allow this type of production on their property and and probably the the lease agreements and um, you know leases and, and legal work that would have to be done and, and aware of you know the regulatory and so that kind of opening up that can of worms um, and then of course access to capital um, where you know as far as we know you know there's pretty much um, you know private funding or um, invest you know private investment um, for cannabis growers um, and I think then having both parties understand uh, those implications and ramifications of you know should the should the farmer um, have a private loan or should you know a farmer have an investor who has you know is sharing equity and, and profits and you know what would be the best for the grower in the long run uh, to to you know have as much equity as they they can um, they can have um, and then of course you know take on some other um, you know, historical um, inequities and, um, you know, think about farmer identify, you know, how different farmer identifies um, and just all that is offered or uh, not offered in the past because of um, all of, you know, all of that. Um, but yeah, I will, I would go back to say land and land and capital. Um, we just see that over and over. Thank you. Nikki, thank, thank you so much again for that really great overview. Um, I really do appreciate it, and I'm sure folks listening in um, do as well, and, and hopefully it's it's a degree of comfort that, that when this does look a little bit more tangible and, and realistic as we work to right-size the market and then get regulations kind of started and, and finalized, that they're not in this alone. So I really appreciate it, and I did know that you, you said um, – you know, likely fall is a good time to start contact the, the interval if anybody's interested. But may I ask, uh, is your email the best the best uh, contact information for anybody listening that that may be uh, thinking of contacting you? Or is there a general inquiry email address at the interval or phone number or, or so on and so forth? Yeah, thanks, Kyle. Yeah, on our on our website, um, on our program page, uh, we do have an online just general questionnaire intake form. And I think that is the best way for, for folks to get connected with us. Great. Well, as we move into summer, well, our website, we'll, we'll start building out a couple of things, and especially as around services offered um, by our, our partners and service providers, and, and we'll make sure that we can link to that page on our website. So thank you so much, Nikki. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you, you all. All right. Next we have joining us Heather Darby with UVM Extension. Heather, are you with us? Yes. Can you hear me? I can. It's a little okay. muted. Um, maybe that's just me. I don't know. Um, yeah, I know it sounded like a, like you're a little bit far away from the microphone, maybe somehow. Oh, wait, can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, that, that yeah, sounds really much great. Better. Okay, so Heather, there we go. <laughs> Heather, thank you so much for taking uh, the time uh, for folks on the phone. Well, I'm sure Heather likely doesn't need too much of an introduction for our audience um, on the phone. Um, Heather Darby, ag agronomy specialist with UVM Extension. I know you've you've had a really um, strong hand in the UVM Hemp Conference over the last couple of years, um, which I have found really insightful and, and helpful even in a virtual platform this last February. Um, so 
thank you for joining us. I think, um, you know, getting your thoughts on how UVM Extension uh, may be looking to, to help folks, you know, from a technical and, and business perspective um, with this kind of emerging market uh, coming online and your, your perspective thoughts for um, cannabis in Vermont would be, would be really great. Yeah, well, great. And again, thanks for having me on the call. Um, now, of course, uh, being a land grant university that's federally funded, I'm sure there'll be some uh, oh, I don't know, precautions or some guidelines that the university will require us to take as we work with um, hemp growers. You know, when we started to work with industrial hemp growers, um, there were some barriers and there still are barriers. I think probably people know that um, even though that is federally legal. Um, but nonetheless, our, our outreach and education is open to all farmers um, and much of the outreach and education that we do focused on hemp is directly related to you know this potential um, upcoming market M many of the practices and management especially um, you know would be very similar to hemp being grown for other cannabinoids and so i feel like we have a lot to offer all hemp growers um, both online resources um, and the conference, as you mentioned, Kyle, that we're going to continue to um, put on throughout the years, as well as workshops um, and webinars and other print materials that we have, again, uh, you know, available to all farmers. Um, and, you know, certainly looking forward to navigating um, how the university can, you know, play a role. Um, with this new emerging market, um, but again, um, well, you know, time is, um, I, you know, I guess with the federal funding, that will be the cautionary note that the university will have. So I think there'll be a few barriers there, but so much of our work is applicable, again, to all growers that um, I know that we will be a resource if that all makes sense. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, that makes a lot of sense to me. And I, I certainly appreciate that there's some kind of, well, hopefully compartmentalizing that needs to go on when it comes to, to being a land grant university. I totally res understand that. I, and one of the things that I've been trying to do is just call around to, to I mean, I've called you too many times and I, I know that and I apologize, but, um, you know, no, and uh, other other providers as well to just get them thinking in this direction where you know if they're if they're willing and, and able to from a funding perspective um start thinking about the most prudent way to go about you know slicing and dicing things to make sure that, th that this community isn't under underserved from a grower perspective uh, recognizing that there's so many great services that will be available for folks if they move into a legal marketplace yeah, and I'm excited to work with um, all farmers, as I've said a few times. And, you know, good agricultural practices are good agricultural practices, regardless of what crop you're growing. And so there's just a lot of basic, you know, um, agricultural knowledge um, that people need to have that we offer in, in just a variety of ways. Um, you know, from business planning to to growing to starting plants to lighting, you know, all these kind of topics we are, you know, covering through technical outreach. Some of the specific questions someone might have, um, you know, can always, I feel like, be answered. Um, and I know we will have some things that we need to navigate, like I mentioned with the university, but I see m most all of our resources, you know, being available again to every farm. So excited great. to work with this group. Yeah, likewise. I know you got a really great team and really intelligent folks with, over there at Extension with you. Um, James, Julie, any any questions for Heather? Heather, um, this is James Pepper. Um, <clears throat> thanks for being here. Um, and thanks for your, uh, you know, demonstrated commitment to, you know, this emerging market. Um, you know, 
our the intent underlying a lot of whatever regulations we come up with are to um, avoid safety risks around consumption of cannabis. Um, but we're directed, of course, to make accommodations for small cultivators um, and craft growers. You know, where do we find that line? Like, how how do we how do we kind of try and build on the best practices, you know, rely on these cultivators that have been doing this for a long time, know what they're doing. They have a reputation that they're trying to uphold. Um, they take great care in a lot of their products, but, you know, we um, need to just make sure that, you know, we're providing Vermonters consumers with a safe tested product. Um, but, you know, recognizing that those create expenses um, for small cultivators. Yeah, so you're asking how, how do we address um, the fact that testing in particular can be very expensive. And so if you're a small grower, that may be a barrier to production. Is that it, what you're saying? Yeah, it, it is. And it's kind of been a common theme that I've been trying to, you know, figure out from all of our witnesses mm -hmm. today. Um, because to me, you know, I, you know, I followed this piece of legislation um, and this is, you know, of the majority of legislators that voted for it, it was be it was for this consumer safety piece. You know, there's 80,000 Vermonters that use cannabis regularly. So, you know, how are we going to make sure that this product is, um, you know, a safe product? Yeah, yeah. And um, testing facilities, you know, oftentimes prices are um, in line with demand, if that makes sense. And so, um, you know, how do you create testing services that are affordable, I think is a question that keeps coming up even with industrial hemp. Um, you know, it's a barrier for many of the small growers, especially within some of the new USDA regulations is just affording hundreds and, you know, thousands of dollars, not hundreds of thousands, but hundreds and thousands of dollars um, for testing. And I think, you know, starting with the business plan, first of all, is going to be really important because I think um, the testing and safety is critical. And then figuring out what, you know, what is that price point for testing services, you know, having the people that are testing at the table, the laboratories, as an example, um, and really trying to figure out how, how do we create adequate testing um, that, you know, I don't want to say it's cheap because, you know, there are people that are running these labs. We have a lab, you know, at UVM, I know what it costs us to run cannabinoids. Um, and I also know it's a lot cheaper for us to do it ourselves than to send it somewhere else. It's a, like, you know, a quarter of the cost. So, um, <laughs> you know, I, I don't have the answer to getting cheap testing. Um, cheap doesn't mean it's not good. Um, but I also sometimes feel like the, the price of testing oftentimes, you know, reflects the demand. So prices may get inflated. Mm -hmm. Um, which is unfortunate for small growers. Can so I, I, I don't really, I, I don't have the answer there, unfortunately. No, no, it's, it, believe me, I don't think anyone has a great answer to that question. I'm sorry to even pose it, but um, uh, can I just ask a quick follow-up? Um, yeah. What, what kind of current capacity for testing do we have in the state? And, um, you know, if we're thinking about trying to supplant the um, kind of legacy market with a regulated market, any sense of, you know, how much more testing we can do and how we can encourage more testing capacity to come online? Yeah, well, we um, we have a couple of labs in Vermont and um, the Agency of Agriculture would likely have better information on this since laboratories are now um, starting to get, you know, sort of registered and certified to test. Um, and I don't know if the testing has to be done locally, but I'm assuming it, it must have to be, must have to stay in mm -hmm. state and can't cross state lines. But I there are a couple, yeah, um, that I, that I've used in the past that I feel are very reputable and have good capacity 
um, and probably could expand capacity, I'm sure, again, you know, if, if the market was there. But um, I feel like the labs that are still there um, are already uh, reputable and, and do other types of testing. You know, they, they didn't just get into the market to test hemp. So I also think that they're there. They're going to be there um, into the future. They're very stable businesses that do a lot of <clears throat> laboratory testing for food products, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So there's a few of those in the state. Very good labs. So Pepper, if, if I might, um, I know that there's one person that's in our audience right now that works for the Agency of Agriculture and also happens to run our hemp or VAFM's hemp program. And I think she might have a couple of thoughts that would complement yeah. Heather's thoughts. So Stephanie, um, and don't worry, I asked Stephanie on the sidelines if, if I could call her. So I'm not putting her completely on the spot, but Stephanie, please uh, please feel free to introduce yourself and provide any thoughts you might have um, as you've been running our hemp program for the last couple of years. Yeah, so can you all hear me? I wanna make sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, so my name is Stephanie Smith and I operate or manage the Vermont hemp program. Um, and I work with Heather <laughs> on many things. Um, nice to hear her voice. Um, and just relative to this testing issue, um, I was listening a little earlier today about, um, I mean, and obviously hemp testing. And I, and I wanted to say that, yes, the hemp program does require a fair bit of testing for potency and contaminants, contaminants including um, total yeast and mold, uh, aerobic bacteria, um, as well as mycotoxins, which are those human uh, pathogens that can impact an individual that's consuming a hemp product. Um, as well as solvents, heavy metals, so on and so forth. So yes, we do require a fair bit of testing, but on the potency side, um, the hemp program is required to test um, by U USDA on a lot, a per lot basis. And so there's an additional requirement that I don't know that the cannabis program would have to embrace um, that does have to exist at the hemp level only because we're involved um, with a federal uh, domestic hemp production program. Um, and it is determined by a definition of um, the term lot, as well as based on a pre-harvest sample, and then that um, span of time to when it's actually harvested, because you can only um, take a sample no more than 30 days before harvest, and if you don't meet that time period, then you have to resample and retest. So um, with that being said, there are, there are some um, uh, specific requirements. <laughs> that don't necessarily apply to the cannabis yeah. program. Um, and in within my world, there has been a conversation about, well, why don't we just test the end product? Um, because that's where the rubber meets the road. Um, and that may be where the rubber meets the road for the cannabis world as well. Um, but there are potentially efficiencies for any business um, that is involved either in hemp or in cannabis, um, especially if you're working at a concentrate level, you can do a fair bit of testing at that particular stage for contaminants um, that you can then build your products from. So you've done the testing on a concentrate and then your products would, uh, for a contaminant perspective, would likely be free and clear um, because you've already done the test. So you can kind of manage your testing that way. Um, for potency at the end use basis, that would obviously have to be um, potentially on a, on a per product level, unless you know your science and your math and you could work it out. Um, as far as how many labs we have in the state of Vermont, um, we pro well, we're currently developing a, um, an interlaboratory comparison study amongst labs in Vermont. And I believe we have about eight labs that are interested in participating. Um, and these are just labs that are capable of testing hemp. They're not necessarily certified by the Agency of Agriculture. Um, this interlaboratory comparison study will allow those labs to compare their results um, between analysts and amongst participating labs to see if they're if they need to make any changes to their procedures. So there's about um, I think it's between eight and ten labs that are going to participating in upwards of um, I think fifteen analysts um, from those labs. Uh, and these, but there's a fair amount actually of um, companies in the state of Vermont that own the equipment um, that can do testing and whether or not uh, they want to step up and become a fee for service lab in our state, you know, that's yet to be determined. And again, it's based on demand and needs uh, and whether or not there's money to be made. 
Um, yeah. But moving on just briefly, uh, the Agency of Agriculture uh, within the hemp program operates a, a certificate lab certification program um, where we evaluate whether or not labs uh, have all of the, um, the personnel, equipment, methodologies, validated um, um, systems and record keeping skills and uh, SOPs addressing complaints if they receive them. We evaluate um, labs in, in certify labs and, and we also require you know, that um, results be presented in a particular matter, manner. Um, and we have certified one lab as of yet uh, and we're hoping to certify some more. Um, and so these would be the third party labs that do the testing for hemp in the state of Vermont. Um, but they are, they to some extent work with us because they're certified and they have to meet certain standards in order to provide that testing. And our hemp rules require that growers and processors um, use those certified labs. So we have some faith within the program that the results that are being provided meet our standards. So, um, and I believe Thanks. cannabis and cannabis products are also listed um, within the law currently. <laughs> And I'm not sure how that's going to integrate, but I guess we'll have that conversation at a later time. Yeah. And uh, just for my comfort, I'm so like, you know, Stephanie, you've, I think, been officially named to the um, advisory panel. And so we're going to have to rely heavily on your expertise. And so grateful for your um, support and willingness to do that. Yes, I'm excited. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie, for taking my request on about a minute's heads up. So really appreciate that. And yes, I look forward to, you know, I've been working with you for like the last year and a half, two years. So I look forward to a continued working relationship. Um, Heather, circling back to you, um, I'm not sure James, Julie, um, for, first of all, I think Heather and Stephanie's overview of that issue kind of was very complimentary. So um, thank you to you both. But um, Heather, circling back to you, I want to let you go. If there's no more questions, I appreciate you joining us for about a half hour. Um, James, Julie, any anything further for Heather? I just would like to get a better understanding of, and I apologize, my dog was having an issue, so I apologize if I missed this, um, a better understanding of why the cost of testing is, feels so prohibitive. Is the actual equipment and the cost and the technology very expensive, or is it a supply and demand issue? I think it's probably um, a little bit of both. Um, it like uh, running the samples can be time consuming. It really depends on, you know, the methodology that you're using. We have um, an HPLC that we use at UVM. We estimate the, the base cost to be about $25 a sample. Um, for us, we don't ha have a service. That's what it costs us to run the samples um, for our research. And um, we're, the real labor is in the interpretation of the data. It takes time to read the peaks. Um, the investment in the equipment, again, you know, if you're, if you already have a lab <laughs> um, that you're running and you're running all kinds of analysis already, the investment of the equipment is probably likely low as well as the supplies um and the reagents because you probably have that kind of infrastructure already available but for a new lab um it would be quite um costly so you know i think there's probably a little bit of both like labs need to make enough money to stay afloat and cover their costs and be able to upgrade equipment over time um so i think it's you know i don't know what the cost for cannabis is versus let's say industrial hemp testing, you know, if if it's different, then it would mean to me that the prices might be being inflated a bit because of that. Um, it may also be insurances that a lab might need to hold because they're testing um, a drug. So I think probably your question requires a further investigation. Um, I, I'm not even sure if we would be able to test um at uvm mm -hmm. because then how would we dispose you know how right. would we dispose of the material you know so there are a lot of you know beyond 
um, just doing the testing, all the other factors that I think have to be considered. Thank you. Well, I'm glad we're starting these conversations so we can all think about it and figure out what's doable and what's not. Heather, thank you so much. Um, can't thank you enough for, for joining us today. I know how busy you are, so um, I really appreciate it. I look forward to, to working with you moving forward. Yeah, I would just add to Kyle, um, you know, connecting growers to our resources that we already have going on. Um, happy to share that information with you. As Stephanie knows right now we have a webinar series um, that you know, we'll have that are covering topics like safety. <laughs> so product safety um, from really uh, like molds, mycotoxins, you know, like I said, a lot of these topics cross um, both growing like hemp for CBD and growing hemp for, um, mm -hmm. you know, recreational purposes as well. So um, it would be good to make sure that all growers have access to the webinar series and other outreach. So anyway. Yes, please. Great. However, we however we as a board can help, you know, disseminate that that notice or information of, of scheduled webinars or other resources that you might have that would make sense for us to put on our website, please um, send them my way or have somebody send them our way. Um, and like I mentioned with Nikki and the Intervale, we'd love to kind of start developing more resource oriented pages. I think, you know, uh, an education before way before enforcement is is a is a part of what we hope to accomplish. So. Yeah, all right, thank you. Thank you. All right, Pepper, I know we're like eight minutes ahead of schedule. Imagine that, um, <laughs> uh, but I'll, I'll turn it back over to you. I think I think we might be ready for um, some public comments if that's where you want to go with the agenda from here. Yeah, I don't think anyone complains about being ahead of schedule. Um, so we would like to, what we're trying to do is just incorporate more public comment throughout our meetings um, so that people can respond to things that they've heard. Um, and so I would like to open um, up to public comment. Once again, we'll do this kind of in two phases where the folks who join through the link and can raise their virtual hand. Um, will go first and then I'll move once we've completed that portion to the folks that are on the phone. Again, if you're on the phone and you want to uh, provide public comment, you hit star six to unmute yourself, but please just wait for uh, me to kind of call on, on the phone folks. So um, I'm just going to go in the order that they're popping up in my um, participant list. And so I'll start with David Templeman. And again, uh, we're going to try and keep it just to a few minutes each if possible. Um, I'll keep it really quick in the conversation with uh, Nikki um, from the intervale. A question was brought up by uh, Pepper regarding um, existing vegetable and fruit uh, indoor operations, uh, indoor grows. Um, and I just wanted to be sure that we don't conflate uh, cannabis indoor cultivation uh, indoor cultivation, meaning uh, artificial lighting, hydroponic, aeroponic systems with, um, say, strawberry or tomato cultivation in a similar operation. Um, those two crops, you know, cannabis compared to any other crop is using a, a different levels of, of nutrients, different intensities of light. So um, I just want to be putting that out there to be careful not to conflate those two items. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. Um, next on my list is uh, Jessalyn. Hi, thanks again for having me and uh, being here today. So just wanted to mention uh, just a little feedback as far as being a cultivating caregiver and a cultivating patient for a long time now. I just want to throw out the idea that in a way we already are small farmers and small integrated licenses. I grow my own, I process my own FICO and RSO. I manufacture that into gummies and brownies and topicals for myself and another nurse that I grow for. So my concern is that S you know, with one six, uh, Act 164, that might change um, some good changes, some bad changes, and what we need to do to ensure caregivers and cultivators in the medical program also have more access to higher plant counts, higher patient counts. So as we're building a system around an adult use, let's 
give better access and better support to the medical system also when we're looking at that. And really, again, I'll reiterate that caregivers really are already integrated licenses for the most part when they're cultivating all the way to that end product. Um, and I wanna make sure that those licenses are affordable for caregivers in that aspect. If caregivers want to hopefully get into the role of doing more cultivation, because we know these are the people who've been doing it for a long time, as well as you, you guys talk often correctly about you know black market folks, but caregivers have been doing this and not making money and not benefiting it. So just to kind of put that out there for them. I'd also like to rec um, ask you guys to look at outdoor cultivation differently for caregivers, as that is a more affordable, easier access way for many to be able to cultivate. And I have to comment about lab testing because that's something that is so important to me and keeping that affordable. That in my mind is a wonderful way we can use the hundreds of thousands of dollars that the medical program already has to make lab testing free for caregivers or patients that cultivate or at least at a very affordable cost. I'm a hemp farmer and I have a CBD business and I full panel lab test all my products and have for years. We're not a lot of companies do that. So I do understand where you test, what you test for, what the cost of that is and what the importance of that is from that medical perspective. So I do think there are ways we can make that affordable and we need to because it is so important to have that aspect. Um, but just wanted to kind of throw in as we continue to talk about small farmers that caregivers really are already doing this and however we can support this aspect along the way um, would be appreciated to keep that in mind too. So thank you. Great. Thanks, Jessica. Thank you, Jessica. Um, next on my list, I have Graham. And Graham, if you might indulge me, I want to practice your last name. Um, Unox Rufinacht. No, that's very. I think I, I used to say Unangst, but I think if you were in the old world, you'd say Unangst. Rufinacht. Okay. Yeah. Unangst. Yeah. Okay. That's Rufinacht. okay. Thanks for trying. <laughs> um, well, thanks for sticking with us today. I know uh, when you have a small child uh, or any children at all, it can be very challenging. Um, but thank you. And um, yeah, if you have any comments, please go ahead. Yeah. Um, I do. And I really appreciate you all making this day happen and bringing all these folks in. And if there are uh, lawmakers and legislators listening, I really hope you see this as an example of what you should be doing and can be doing in the future. Our groups and others will be pushing for um, more reforms going forward. And I think you all brought in more agricultural experts today than the legislature saw in six years. Um, so thank you. Um, secondly, uh, I just wanted to, in the, before the the lunch break, there was a conversation and it was just about clarifying that we can vertically integrate. And I think I just wanted to clarify that, yes, one entity can buy a, pro a manufacturer's license and a retail license and a cultivator's license. Our concern is that that's not going to be affordable. And that's why we propose a small uh, integrated small farm license where those would all be integrated together into a very accessible, affordable um, package. And that would be sort of mimicking what current illicit market folks or um, the, the um, legacy market folks are doing. And hopefully create a, you know an entreaty to to join the market. Um, I have benefited from the intervale farm viability program, my grass fed beef business, and the home to farm scale sort of edible landscaping work that we've done in the past. And I can't say enough great things about it. Um, extension also incredible work. But what I think is really ironic about this conversation is that you just brought in agricultural experts to speak on a non agricultural issue. Um, we keep using the words farmers, we keep using the word crops, and it honestly just feels a little disrespectful and insulting. Um, they mentioned some, Nikki mentioned the biggest barriers are land, access to land and capital. And we have made it even more challenging by making this non-agricultural. I'd love to ask Heather or Nikki or anyone at those organizations, you go down those stairs. She wants to go down some stairs on her own. This is Juniper. <laughs> Um, I'd love to ask those folks what the bigger bear, you know, if, if a farmer was trying to farm on commercially zoned land, you know, how successful would they be? Because that's what we're being asked to do. And it's, and it's entirely unacceptable, um, and disrespectful. Um, and it's not, I'm not putting that in your court, the CCB. I think you have the power to really shift a lot of this and make recommendations otherwise, but I'm just saying that to all the elected representatives out there who passed this law. And um, I think in terms of the testing, you know, there's been a lot of great recommendations, subsidies for 
for caregivers, for small farmers, for social equity applicants. But the state can also pony up. They're going to make a lot of revenue from this industry, and they can they could certainly put in place infrastructure to really make uh, an accessible, um, highly credible third party testing uh, infrastructure here that could that could satisfy all the needs of our community members and really create the equitable market we want. And I think that's that's one thing we could look at, um, as well as the subsidies. Um, so I guess I'll just leave it there, but I really want to, again, emphasize that access to land and access to capital across farming is, as Nikki said, the, those are the common things we hear about, and in particular in socially disadvantaged communities. Um, I believe that 98% of the farmland owned in, the, in Vermont is owned by people who identify as white. Um, and I do not know what the commercial land situation is, but, and I'd also love to ask Heather and Nikki, if a farmer were to have to grow on commercial land, I'd, what's the quality of the soil there? You know, what is the likelihood that that's going to be a great place to grow an outdoor crop? We sh um, there's just so many questions, but I'll leave it there. And, and thanks. Thank you all again. Yep. All right. Thanks, Graham. Um, next on my list is Stephanie. Ooh. Hi again, everyone. Thanks for your time. Um, thank you, Graham, for sharing that. It was great to get to see Juniper, and you brought up a lot of great points there, especially with about the quality of the soil of the commercial land. Um, I first wanted to just acknowledge again the recognition of the historical racial inequity of the of um, with hemp and how it became illegal in the first place and what the reasons behind that were and how it shaped um, basically American culture and the system of recidivism that happens within the criminal system. And so again, I just wanted to acknowledge that, especially as a white person. Um, and then second of all, I had a question, which was, is there any way for the agency of agriculture, the agency public safety or the agents to be able to create a lab to test their cannabis products um, because then they could offer those services to companies based on their income or based on you know the amount of product that that particular business produces um, and then that ensures you know equitable access for vermonters as well as safety so that that's my second question well, first question. Well, thank you for that. We're not really in a position to answer, um, but uh, yeah. thank you for that. And it's something that we certainly are um, going to dig into as a board. And you know, so for now, we can treat it as kind of a rhetorical question that can guide us. Um, but thank you. Are there any other um, comments from people that have joined through the link? And if there are, just please raise your virtual hand. Uh, just, Jessalyn, um, is that hand up from earlier or is this a new comment? No, it's just a new comment. I just wanted to mention one thing about lab testing, because again, that is so important, is when we talk about the hemp program, I think they have great recommendations, but there's no way of enforcing that. So as we talk about hemp, I'm, I'm sorry, as we talk about testing, we should also be considering how are we going to actually make sure that testing is happening and what is the system around that so we can ensure that safety through that testing because just making recommendations doesn't necessarily mean that that's also happening with that testing. Okay, thank you. Um, Graham, is that is your hand up from before? Let me just see if there's anyone else uh, before I go to you on the phone um, that'd like to make a comment. And again, if you would like to speak, just hit star six to unmute yourself and you can just um, kind of chime in. No, OK, Graham, do you want to add follow up? Yeah, thanks. There's just one more thing I wanted to mention. Um, that was to clarify something that my our coalition partner, Jeffrey Pizzatello, said before from the Vermont Growers Association. He was speaking to a survey that was used to inform the thousand square feet of small growing space and some of the fees associated with it. And we just wanted to clarify that that thousand square feet was um, for indoor production, not for outdoor production. And it's, uh, I believe he said 65 uh, percentage of the correspondence, the respondents to the survey uh, want to grow outdoor. 
So I just wanted to clarify that that 1,000 square feet was specifically for indoor production, which also you know gets to Jahela's point that 1,000 square feet of outdoor production is is really going to be very challenging to make a business financially viable off of. And that's why we recommend a one to four ratio, so the 4,000 square feet of outdoor production being the base the base outdoor production level. So I was just hoping I just add some clarity there. Thank you. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Um, anyone else, um, either on the phone or in the, uh, in the audience? Okay. Um, well, I think we have one last agenda item for today. Um, yes. Uh, so this is, um, an exciting moment for us as a, um, control board. Um, you know, we have interviewed a number of great candidates, uh, for our executive director. I was just incredibly impressed by the caliber of people that came forward and were willing to take on this incredibly challenging and complex role, um, that has been laid out by statute, um, and just has so many different um, kind of tentacles all over uh, state government and the legislature and the courts. I mean, it's just going to be an incredibly challenging position. Um, we have um, extended an offer um, to uh, our finalists, and so we'd like, and she has accepted. So we'd like to announce her and vote on whether we can hire her. Um, and so our candidate is Bryn Hare, and she um, has just an incredible background in uh, legislative and uh, civil litigation. Um, she has been at the center of every criminal justice reform bill that's passed the legislature um, in the past eight years. Um, she has written all of the expungement laws that we've seen over the past four years um, that have had a direct uh, result in, you know, over 25,000 expungements. And uh, in the last three years, she um, wrote three police reform bills. Um, and, uh, you know, she just brings a very calm, cool, collected demeanor with an incredible um, amount of uh, legal talent and creativity to back it all up. And, um, you know, I just am so fortunate that she was willing to take this on. So, um, she has, she, uh, has some things to wrap up with the legislature. She won't be starting right away. Um, but I think, uh, Kyle, Julie, is there's anything you want to add? Otherwise, um, I'd like to, um, ask for a motion to, um, hire Bryn Hare as our executive director. Um, I, I would just add that um, I was impressed with Bryn from the moment that I met her because she has this very welcoming and thoughtful approach to her nature and her work. And I think that that will be paramount to our work together as a board, but then also the work that we're doing with the public. Um, and I would be happy to move to select her as the executive director. Very quickly, I, I, I certainly agree with everything Julie and, and James said. Bryn um, has a, a cool, calming, but infectious demeanor. You want to work with her. You want to learn with her, collaborate with her. Um, I'm really excited at the prospect of, of working with her and um, us learning certain parts of, of this whole puzzle together. Um, and I'm really excited. So I'll second your motion, Julie. Great. All in favor? Hi. 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 All right. Well, that um, is done. And um, now that we kind of have our core team together between Bryn and Nelly, um, again, I just uh, would mention that we're going to start seek actively seeking a consultant um, that can kind of fill in the gaps that we don't bring to the table on this. And it's not just going to be the consultant. Um, you know, we have a now 14 member advisory committee um, that will be advi advising us. Um, again, we're going to try to uh, bring in as many witnesses as we can um, to help wrap our minds around all of the complexities of the issues that are ahead. And um, I guess if anyone who's listening is interested in being a consultant, we're going to post our kind of the scope of work of what we need, what we feel we need. Um, 
And um, we're going to set our next meeting um, is likely going to be next Thursday, probably the same time frame. Um, once we are able to, um, and hopefully not too far in the distance, we'll adopt a regular meeting schedule. However, it's our intention currently to kind of operate on this, this, this similar schedule of Thursdays. And um, next week, we'll probably hopefully have more of our advisory committee um, has will have been appointed and we can start to talk more openly about those folks. And um, I think next week we have a pretty solid agenda um, in place. Um, there's some issues that we're still going to wrap uh, wrap up um, before we post it, but it's going to be focused on um, some of the social historic social equity issues, what other states have um, tried to do to um, uh, encourage uh, social equity applicants um, into the market and um, what's worked, what hasn't worked, what we can do um, in Vermont that might be slightly different. Um, so that's kind of the overview. That'll be next uh, Thursday. And I don't know, Julie, Kyle, am I missing anything before we adjourn? I think very quickly on the request for uh, consulting services, I would just I would state that it's it's more than likely going to be up on our website tomorrow. You can find it there. There's an opportunity to ask us uh, questions even before a certain date. It, it'll likely be open for around two weeks or so. Um, we're not going to accept late applications or late proposals. We uh, really want to get this uh, process started now that we know that Brent will be joining us and we have a good understanding of the skill set that she's uh, bringing to the table. So we, we know that there's a lot of interest in the in what the consultant is going to look like, who it's going to be, um, so on and so forth. Um, and that should be up tomorrow. And then with the passage of S25, did you say this at the beginning, James? We have two additional positions that we'll be looking That's for. That's right. That's yeah. right. And, and in fact, we'll probably be posting three positions, actually. Um, you know, Nellie, uh, we tried to get her in quickly. We got her into a temporary role. We um, are so we have two admins. One is going to be more of a program manager, a um, administrative services manager, and then um, one will be kind of more of a um, administrative services coordinator, potentially. Um, and then we'll have a general counsel position. And so we will be posting those as, as quickly as we possibly can. I think that's it on my end. Mm -hmm. OK, um, well, great. Thank you so much, Kyle, for setting up the agenda. Thank you to all of our witnesses today. Um, I feel like, uh, you know, it's going to take a little while for me to digest everything that we've heard, but it does sound like we share a lot of the common goals. I think there's more that unites us um, than there are that divides us right now. Um, and uh, it's just, uh, I'm glad that we're getting a lot of this feedback. Um, and, you know, the, you know, we're going to try and have as collaborative a process as we move forward, especially as we bring in our executive director and our consultant, and we have advisory committee meetings and subcommittee meetings. Yeah, I want to, I want to, compound that a little bit. Thank you to all of our, our witnesses and folks that um, offered up time of their Thursday morning. Um, we recognize that 930 to 2 isn't always the best time for everybody in the community to really engage, especially those um, with young children or, or, you know, trying to get plants in the ground, whatever they may be growing. But um, uh, we didn't get to really express that proper thank you as we were trying to move through our agenda. So um, thank you. There's going to be a lot of follow up from our end. I know that James, Julie and myself probably have a laundry list of questions. I took feverish notes the whole the whole the whole morning, it felt like. So, um, you know, we certainly appreciate the continuing dialogue. I also want to just stress that while we heard from small cultivators on Thursday, June 10th, it will not be the last time that we want to bring this community in to talk before the full board. Um, in addition to talking through subcommittees that we will be forming and, and, you know, the ability for any of the three of us to kind of engage with you one on one to learn more. So thank you so much, everybody. Thank you to everybody who just listened in today or offered public comment. It really um, does help us in this process. Thank you, Kyle. Um, so I guess we can adjourn at this point. Um, does anyone want to make a motion to adjourn? I'll move to adjourn. I'll second. All in favor?
Bye. Bye. Okay. Thank you all. Um, Nelly, I think you can at this point stop the recording and.